מותר כאילו היום? Hey, how are you? Very well, how are you? We're doing great, thank you. Good, good. Aaron, I'm sure it's uh, middle of the night for you. Thank you for joining us. No, it's, listen, it's my pleasure. I mean, you know, with, with the COVID and everything that's going on, it's kind of nice to do a little bit of like face-to-face -face IP work. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. Hi, Sohas. Hey, hi, Jedi. Hi, Girish Bay. Hey, Aaron, how are you doing? Yeah, hello, how are you? Fine, thank you. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Yes, yes, yes. My pleasure, very happy to be here. Yeah. Dr. Modak, uh, can you hear us? Please join, Mr. Modak. Yeah, Jadeep. I can. Hi, Girish. Good to see you. Thank you. I see uh, you, Ms. Mr. Kuzova has also joined us. Um, I hope you can hear us okay. We'll uh, get started in a couple of minutes. We'll start shop at two o'clock. Uh, that is India time. Good to see you, Dr. Sir.
All right. Um, a very good afternoon to all of you, and a good evening to our uh, friends in Japan and China. And um, I don't know whether it's uh, still good evening for you, Aaron, or good morning. I know you've joined us in uh, middle of the night. It's one thirty a.m. for you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm uh, Jaydeep Kewalramani. I'm the CEO of Legacies, and uh, I'm very delighted that uh, we are here to welcome you to the first edition of Legacies World IP Day. Uh, the current situation and the World IP Day theme of green innovation is actually a paradox. We live in interesting times. I thank the dignitaries, uh, Dr. Garda, Dr. Uh, Marshalkar, Dr. Prasad Modak, Professor J.P. Joshi, Professor Anil Gupta, Dr. Santosh Mohanty, uh, Sri Girish Joshi, Mr. Manish Sudan, um, Mr. Kuzwa, Dr. Ida and Aaron Hovitz for joining us today. I also thank our chairman, Arun Kulkarni, executive director, Ramesh Sharma, founder director, Sohas Tuljapurkar, our uh, board of directors, Dr. Sardesh Mukh, Mr. Rajesh Pagga, Mr. Ashok Malhotra, and Mr. Tarun Mathur for uh, gracing this occasion. A special thanks to uh, Sri Ashish Bhai Chauhan, managing director of uh, BSE for supporting us. And a big thank you to our partners, RSM and Bombay Chambers for their support. Uh, clearly, uh, you know that Legacies is an industry thought leader and prides in serving over 1,200 clients over 60 countries uh, for intellectual property, compliance, ethics, and legal solutions. Uh, we are well prepared and have been supporting our ecosystem during these COVID-19 times. Uh, when Ashish Bhai, uh, and our chairman, Arun, first helped us conceptualize this event. We had planned to host it at the central hall of the BSE in Mumbai. Uh, it would have been a grand setting for us. Clearly, the current situation has pivoted us to a digital event. Uh, please pardon us for any imperfections you may experience during the course of this event. Uh, we are also uh, live casting on YouTube, uh, so our uh, friends from around the world can watch us live on YouTube as well. As a run-up to uh, this World IP Day celebration, we actually conducted over 100 IP mining sessions. We reached out to over 100 companies and helped their inventors, R&D people to discover intellectual property while they were all remote working uh, during the lockdown that we are experiencing, not just in India, but uh, across the world. Uh, we also conducted a 24-hour hackathon um, we had several teams participate. Um, we will recognize some of the winners today. And we also are recognizing green innovators who've done considerable work in this space. Green is the new order and there is no alternative but to embrace it fully. Nature has shown us the way we need to accelerate it and grab the opportunity. Green chemistry, circular economy is the new order of the day. Uh, we have an exciting lineup of experts for the evening and uh, without much ado, I would like to invite our first speaker of the day, Dr. Uh, Modak. Uh, just to introduce uh, Dr. Modak, Dr. Modak is currently Executive President of Environmental Management Center, LLP. He's also the founder. He's a director of Econic Knowledge Foundation. Uh, prior to that, he was a professor at Indian Institute of Bombay. Dr. Modak has worked with almost all key United Nations developmental institutions and intergovernmental organizations in the world. Apart from the government of India and various state governments, his advice is sought by governments of Bangladesh, Egypt, Indonesia, Mauritius, Thailand, and Vietnam. He's a member of Indian Resources Panel at Ministry of Environment, Forest, and Climate Change a member of the Task Force on Sustainable Public Procurement at the Ministry of Finance. Dr. Modak drafted the report on resource efficiency and circular economy, current ways and way forward for the Niti IO, which is the think tank of India. He was a contributor to the United Nations Environment Program Green Economy Report, a co-author of the Global Waste Management Outlook and chief editor of Asia Waste Management Outlook for the United Nations Environment. Dr. Modak has published several books on environmental management. 
he has been a recipient of the alumni award of aitaa in 2010 for significant contribution to international affairs uh, dr modak thank you for joining us uh, over to you thank you thank you jaydeep and uh, very good afternoon evening uh, to colleagues here and the the audience uh, i'm going to do a short presentation jaydeep i thought uh, show maybe a few slides and you know set the stage and i think that's will be the best i thought that you know that will prompt then not just the uh, discussions but you know we could lead to the speakers who are going to follow so let me share the screen now jaydeep and show some slides yeah certainly um mac could you stop sharing your screen so that dr modak could share his thank you uh can you all view the slides uh, yes we can okay so the topic of the day is the innovate for the green future and i'm going to do a bit of an introduction to put the context why do we do it and how do we do it and how exciting this is going to be when we want looking for green innovations there's a very interesting triangle here in front of us where one of the ages is resources the other one is the residues which we generate when we consume these resources and if we over consume the resources or don't manage the residues what we all face is the risks so these three r's of the triangle are very important because all of us involved there like the governments the businesses the investors and the communities all have a role to play in this three ages of the triangle and all face therefore the types of risks which i talked about if you over consume our resources or don't manage our residues responsibly over a period of time you must have observed that the material flows which were initially local regional or national today they are all global and that's something important for us to remember that these material flows are also skewed because the way resource pricing has been done you also see now deeper and deeper supply chains and they have touch points to the informal sector which is again very important to note that you do see now a complexity when it comes to running the supply chains on a global basis if you want to understand innovation i find sometimes the simplest definition is innovation is about staying relevant so we want to remain relevant and we are actually looking for innovations driven by problems and opportunities both but remember not just for today but as anticipated in the future so we are talking about when we said we want to look for green innovations for or or innovations for green future i think this definition fits very well what do we mean here by innovation where are we looking for innovations there are many many opportunities many places we look for them in the materials the processes which we use the products we make and the services we offer and here i mean the business models these four important areas tell us how we see innovation and what innovation is going to lead into you know in the earlier slide i was highlighting products and this is some area which i feel of great importance when we talk about greening our future so we really don't see much happening on the term we use eco product design or green products but that's one space one area for innovation if you look at the drivers to innovation there would be of course the opportunities people see competition constraints which we face often in resources especially and the challenges that we get into and the challenges can be multiple including governance the policies and the regulations now when we say we want to go green actually we want we are talking about how do we become sustainable so if you take that thread you will see that greening here is really taking us to a a road map towards sustainability and we done that in many ways by agreeing commonly by setting sustainable development goals 
Innovation, where I'm spelling there for I as E, more look towards environment. That innovation, the way we're looking at it is to be more smart while getting towards sustainability. We use this term many times called smart sustainability. And that's where innovations come in and they help. When we had the economic meltdown earlier, 2008, 2009, many of you may recall that United Nations Environment Program came with an approach of green economy. I was involved in those reports and we tried to figure out where can we strategically put the stimulus that by putting small amounts at right places, we could do a turnaround. And I think many of you might have seen these reports already on the green economy websites, but they are quite insightful in the context of what we're going through today, that how do we find the right points to leverage? The way of what we see, I think uh, JDP already spoke about, is looking at now the economy in circularity, or we use the term circular economy. And, may, and many believe, and I strongly agree also, that this is actually the platform for innovation. Innovations we are talking towards the green future. Circular economy is going to be an interesting platform. This is a bit of a busy slide, but what it is showing you is a wheel of circular economy. And what you see around here are 12 hours, right from refuse, reduce, redesign, reuse, repair, refurbish, renovate, recycle, recover, return, remanufacture, and even rethink. And what you see in the outer circle are all the stakeholders, including communities, policymakers, regulators, what have you, investors, innovators, you know, people who are developing technologies, researchers, academia, a very important element, the informal sector. And this wheel, in order to roll, all these stakeholders had to come together and we got to deploy this 12 hours in a way that we get better outcomes or move, we move towards greener future. And in this, you would see very interesting paradigms of movement of products, raw materials, services between urban rural segments, formal informal segments. So it's a very complex application of the wheel going to be when we talk about such interactions. So what we got to do perhaps is to adapt, mainstream and leverage on what we already have. For example, the Ministry of Environment, Forests and Climate Change has drafted a national policy on resource efficiency. I think it's a worth a read what it's communicated in this national policy. And remember that resource efficiency doesn't mean resource sufficiency. These are important terms have to be looked at together and you see that being discussed in the National Policy on Resource Efficiency. There's another drive which has been under discussion over a year now on sustainable public procurement at the Ministry of Finance. And this is something which to me is a game changer in India's consumption and production patterns. And it will harbor a lot of innovations. I talked about circular economy and then I was involved in preparing a roadmap on circular economy, where we had an extensive dialogue with nine, nine ministries. And we found that that itself is a huge opportunity where we could actually address and position the informal sector, which is very important, very much distinguishing feature from the circular economy models, what you see in other countries. So let's adapt to mainstream and leverage on what we already have. And we got to look at this context as an ecosystem where we not only look at the challenges and opportunities or context and relevance where we want to innovate, but identify beneficiaries, get them involved for co-creation processes. And like holding hackathons and looking at research parks, incubators and accelerators, interested investors to get more and more entrepreneurship, which will ride on these innovations. 
So let me summarize and end saying that let us all build together our innovation capital. And again, I'm using the term instead of IE, saying that we got to really look at these green innovations so that we move towards a greener future. I'm going to end my presentation here. I thought this is enough for setting up the stage. And thank you, Jadeep. And thank you, Suhas, for inviting me. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Modak. That was very enlightening. Uh, I'll request our host of the day, Ryan, to uh, take over and request Mehek to very quickly, please, give us a quick glimpse of the agenda of the day so that uh, our attendees know what's uh, the lineup. Uh, over to you, Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chair Kulkarni. Um, I'd like to now invite our first panel on board. Uh, the topic of discussion would be this far no further. I'd like to invite Ms. Aditi Gelot, Head of IP Delivery Legacies, Dr. Masato Idea, Vice President, Patent Attorney, SEGA International Patent Office, Japan. Dr. Ida is recognized by IM Patent 1000 2019 as the world's leading patent professionals, intellectual assess management. Mr. Aaron, Mr. Aaron D. Hoosworth. Senior IP Counsel, Kengzin Partners, China. Mr. Hoosworth specializes in IP transactions and due diligence, IP strategy consultancy, IP dispute, relation, resolution consultant, IP enforcement, licensing, United States intellectual property, corporate law, and Mr. Kiyoshi Kuzawa, President Kuzawa Partners, Japan. Mr. Kuzawa has a variety of experience in the field of IP, and is involved in legal affairs at the JPO for changing the Japan patent law, revising examination guidelines, et cetera, as a deputy director at the legal division of the JPO. Over to you. Okay. Mm, yes. Um, thank you, Ryan, for the introductions. And now we have the panelist of from Shiga uh, International, uh, Kuzuwa and Partners and uh, Kangs and Partners. Um, why, uh, thank you everyone for joining in. And uh, the theme for this panel discussion is uh, this far, no further. Uh, the concept is that we, uh, over the period of few months have say, seen a paradigm shift in things. Uh, shift in how we are working currently, how we are uh, innovating and where uh, the things will lead from here. So this being the topic, we thought uh, we take uh, the views from uh, people and IP fraternity in uh, countries like Japan and China and how they see as the rise of innovations and uh, what challenges the innovators will be facing in uh, these coming times. Um, will there be a change in the innovation sectors? Uh, we have seen uh, automobile industry coming up, uh, more of artificial intelligence being talked about, but uh, in few months, there has been a shift in requirement to develop more in pharmaceutical industry, in medical devices. So uh, we will uh, have a lively discussion about uh, how the panel feels about the current situation and how uh, we as IP fraternity would see things uh, in innovating and patenting here. So with that, um, my first question to all the panelists is uh, how uh, the technical innovation and legal framework would change after COVID-19? And if there are special uh, sector we take as pharma and medical industry, uh, what is the challenge they feel uh, the innovators will have in coming months or years? So uh, we can start with first Mr. Kuzuwa uh, about his thoughts on this topic. Uh, Mr. Kuzuwa, uh, probably you are on mute. Uh, 
Mr. Kuzwa, are you able to hear us? Um, I have unmuted him, but still it's from his side here. Okay. Um, Mahek, uh, while you uh, can check with uh, Mr. Kuzwa, we can have uh, um, Mr. Aida talk about this and uh, we will take from there. You mean um, uh, I'm first? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Namaste. Uh, firstly, thank you for coordinating this web event, RDT. It's also my great pleasure to spend time with you all. Uh, now we are going through very difficult times. So uh, I'd like to um, share how and what Japanese private sectors and public sectors are, are coping with the COVID-19 crisis. And uh, firstly, uh, uh, we, are, uh, we are patent attorneys. So um, first, uh, we'd like to talk about the uh, uh, GPO uh, remedial measures. Uh, the JPO issued an announcement on April 3rd uh, regarding procedure to be carried out after due dates as a result of the COVID-19 coronavirus. And the JPO suggested some remedial measures. Uh, in order for relief to be granted, the necessity of the relief needs to be recognized by the JPO. So far, no specific examples regarding the necessity of the relief have been described in the official announcement by the JPO. And difficulties uh, for obtaining the relief uh, may not be so severe. Uh, at present, we cannot guarantee that the JPO will easily admit the reliefs. So uh, we recommend trying to carry out uh, necessary procedures by the original due dates as much as possible. Uh, procedures after the original due date may be accepted if the uh, coronavirus is a cause. And now uh, I'll show you some of the relief measures that would be subject to extensions. And there are 10 examples. One, uh, submission or proof of exception of loss of novelty. Two, submission of priority certificate. Three, filing a divisional application. Four, uh, payment of registration. Five, filing appeal against decision of rejection. Six, submission of a Japanese translation of a foreign language patent application. Seven, request for sub substantive examination. Eight, with payment of annuities. Nine, PCT national phase entry and submission of Japanese translations thereof. Ten, uh, filing a request for registration of renewal. And uh, uh, if you want to know uh, more details about other ex extendable procedures, uh, please refer to the JPO website. And regarding procedure uh, one to five, uh, I, uh, I mentioned, uh, for example, uh, filing a divisional application, uh, filing an appeal against, uh, against decision of rejection, uh, we need two requirements. And uh, uh, one, uh, it's, um, it's uh, within, uh, it, uh, it should be done within two months uh, from the date on which the reason for having been able to complete the procedure with a time limit ceased to exist. And second, within six months from the date on which the original uh, time limit expired. 
And uh, regarding the procedures six to 10, uh, I mentioned uh, we need two requirements. So uh, the example of the uh, procedures is, uh, so for example, uh, PCT national phase entry and submission of Japanese translation thereof. And uh, so one of the requirement is uh, which, uh, within two months from the date on which the reason for not having been able to complete the procedure within the time limit ceased to exist. Second, uh, within one year from the date on which the original time limit expired. And uh, regarding the uh, claiming priority, uh, red priority claims must be filed within two months from the date on which the original time limit expired. And, uh, and furthermore, apart from the, the above remedial um, measures, I said, the JPO currently has not good gone through in-person interviews and oral meetings, uh, and oral meetings, but uh, has conducted online interviews. It's just the current information regarding the, uh, uh, the uh, relief uh, measurement uh, measures by JPO. Can I go to the second topic? Yes, so um, I think we'll hear Aaron what he has to say about uh, change in uh, the shift in uh, the technology sectors and how uh, Aaron sees uh, uh, the change in innovation in pharma uh, from mm -hmm. perspective of China. Yeah, uh, so, um, yeah, so uh, according to you. Oh, okay. Please. I will see him. Sure. Oh, no problem. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Legacy, so much for having me. Um, my name is Aaron Hurwitz. I'm Senior Foreign Counsel for Kangshin Partners in Beijing. Um, I live in Beijing for, for most of the year, um, but I've been stuck in California now for about five months because of the same thing that's impacting all of us. <laughs> And, but very happy to be here. Um, thankfully, China's coming out of this. You know, unfortunately, we were the first country uh, where, where COVID-19 originated. And so um, coming out of this, um, thankfully, and as, as China's really starting to emerge again, there, there are a lot of trends and things that are already beginning to happen on the IP side. So first of all, we think it's going to be called a slow rush to the patent office. Um, during, during the real pa uh, COVID pandemic, we were seeing a great deal of increase in, in interest with regard to traditional Chinese medicine. Now, as a whole traditional Chinese medicine, there's some questionability with regard to the, the patent requirements, but we think that there's going to be a big push, um, possibly from a governmental level, but certainly from the private sector, to be able to, to patent a great deal of this. Now, as a whole, coming out of COVID, there's great emphasis on China to really improve the quality and the efficiency of the Chinese patent office. They understand that now, although in the past, everything was certainly made in China, now they want things to be invented in China. So they wanna change the innovation paradigm. And we're seeing that significantly, for example, the examination criteria in China has been dramatically uh, compressed to 17.3 months as a whole for important inventions. Also, IP services and investment as a whole in China, there's dramatic increase um, in, in investment, and I'll get to that in a second. But China knows that there's a stigma involving China with regard to enforcement of intellectual property rights. And for, for, a, large, uh, for a long time, everybody would say, why even file in China? Because simply you cannot enforce in China. Now China's realized that and, and they really believe that, we really believe in China that having a strong enforcement system will continue to allow our patent system to grow because it'll create consumer confidence not only in China mainland, but also internationally. 
And so as a whole, China is going to increase statutory damages for all enforcement measures from 3 million um, Chinese RMB, which is a little uh, less than half a million US dollars, um, to, a, uh, to a total of 5 million RMB, which is about 700,000 US dollars. Now, as China strengthens their IP rights, um, China is going to do it on their own. Um, it is their goal going forward to um, personally prosecute 32,000 trademark violations, 77,000 patent violations, a number of unfair competition cases. And China uh, has a goal of prosecuting 24,000 um, criminal cases with regard to counterfeiting and IP uh, um, infringement. Um, and as we've seen over many years, we've seen a massive increase in um, patent and trademark filings in China. And a lot of the reasons because of that, I should say, is for a long time, China really wanted to get into the innovation game. And in China's mind, they said, look, to compete on the global stage, it's imperative for us to get our patent numbers up and we need to really uh, increase and bolster innovation. And so what they did is for Chinese companies, they would say, all right, we're gonna offer subsidies for you to file patent applications. Now, unfortunately, this may have backfired a little bit, but it certainly got IP on the minds of everybody because Chinese companies were filing more patent applications than anybody right. could. And in China, we have a uh, patent for utility model, design and patent for invention. And so we were seeing a whole plethora and a magnitude of scale of patent files simply because various companies wanted to get the subsidy instead of getting, uh, certainly pursuing their intellectual property rights. So China's really gonna move from a quantity aspect going forward, it's gonna be solely quantity. Um, China's really gonna continue to invest in um, IP. Right now, 12% of Chinese GDP is solely due to um, patent related industries. And um, China's technology contracts are roughly uh, 1 billion Chinese RMB per year. And they wanna increase that uh, to double it within a year. And really, I think China's main goal is to be uh, a, a global IP player. China wants to be along the lines of India, the United States, Japan, Korea, other, other Europe, the, the EPO, as other great nations in the IP world who really have a seat at the table to, to really work to dictate things. Now, in terms of the challenges organizations face in the private sector, I think there are a whole magnitude of challenges that are important to address. I think there's gonna be stricter scrutiny with regard to investment that private sectors uh, are, are willing to invest on their IP side now. Mar the market has certainly shifted and a variety of companies have sustained a great deal of damage due to COVID-19. And so unfortunately, as we all know being lawyers and certainly in the IP sector, IP is kind of the first one to get their budget cut because unfortunately companies are more driven on the business side than perhaps on the research and development side. So we think there's gonna be stricter scrutiny in the level of uh, disclosures coming out of companies. There's gonna be a balance between investment and capital allocations. And I do think that there are market concerns. There's market concerns in the short term and certainly the long term. And something that we should all touch on because we're all doing it right now. I think there's gonna be a balance internally in many innovation and uh, research and development areas because there's gonna be the balance of keeping their staff working from home because it has everybody's found that it is a very efficient way to go forward versus having their, their innovators actually in the lab in their lawyers and um, you know, their engineers in the office when they know that they can be equally as efficient at home. And so the company is going to be saving overhead. So I think that's going to be sort of a dramatic balance that a lot of companies will need to figure out going forward. Okay. And thank you. So, uh, yes, uh, that is definitely interesting to hear because uh, China is a uh, something that has gone great on innovations. And it seems like a lot of countries are seeing uh, uh, how uh, and where the innovation leads to in countries like China and Japan. So uh, if uh, we have Mr. Kuzuwa here. Uh, Do you hear me? Yes, yes. Oh, you. really? Yes, yes. OK, OK, audible. thank you. Thank you, OK. Okay. Uh, so I switch to some other speaker as, as okay. Mike. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Great Thank to you have much. you back. Yes. Okay. So uh, what we were discussing is um, how um, China and Japan sees uh, the going forward in uh, IPs and innovation. 
So it will be great to hear how Japan is uh, looking at this current situation of COVID and um, where you see uh, uh, the IP trend as. Okay, first, uh, I thank you very much uh, for inviting me to the, this uh, very, very good event. So uh, uh, I'm speaking now from my home. So I'm, I'm just uh, teleworking at, that time, at, at this time. And uh, yeah, I hope every, everyone is doing well, despite the uh, weird uh, coronavirus situation. And uh, uh, Corona COVID-19 will drastically change not only our current life under the pandemic uh, uh, situation, but also our future life in various ways, I think. In fact, our firm just started teleworking in the end of February. Uh, at that time, only for some of people at the, at the beginning. And at first, we are all very much anxious about the uh, uh, working style, which we have never experienced so far, in, in particular in Japan. Unlike the United States, for example, uh, I, I have, I've heard that the uh, US PTO examiner is uh, pretty much uh, teleworking right now, but uh, for a long time already. But uh, I've never heard that the Japanese patent office uh, examiner uh, uh, working home or teleworking. So, but uh, our colleague at uh, now, uh, uh, so since uh, last week, our colleague are uh, totally teleworking now. Everybody is now teleworking. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, we have gradually been uh, getting used to this type of uh, working, working style. And we are about to get to love this lifestyle, perhaps, I guess. Uh, especially uh, IP people do like uh, this type of uh, working, I think. Uh, Taking a look at the uh, IP, uh, especially pharma IP, uh, pharma IP, uh, COVID-19 would not only affect the uh, IP people, uh, IP people's lifestyle, but, but also devastatingly change the uh, IP sy system per se, I guess. And, uh, as you know, uh, perhaps uh, Japan is the uh, uh, third largest farm market in the world. Say, uh, uh, last year, uh, annual sales are around uh, 86 uh, uh, billion US dollars. That's a huge market. The share of this uh, market has uh, historically been changing uh, uh, between innovators and uh, generic companies. But now uh, Japan introduced a substance patent system, uh, Japan in introduced substance patent system into uh, Japan patent law in 1975, long time ago, and the patent term extension system in 1989, both of which are uh, uh, epoch making, so to speak, for Japan, Japanese pharma IP. Although the uh, Japanese government has been uh, very strongly promoting nowadays the expansion of the uh, market share of generic, generic drugs in these years. And in fact, it has been reached up to 73% in 2018. It can be said that the uh, Japanese IP system is still in favor of innovators, where uh, generics uh, uh, cannot easily enter Japanese market. This is uh, uh, especially problematic to the uh, pandemic uh, time, like in the in the in the current situation, where we need any uh, any anti-COVID-19 drug, irrespective of uh, whether they are innovator or generic uh, drugs. So, uh, however, the government or even United Nations should not interfere the IP right. 
even at the pandemic time, I, I guess, this is a very important or very fundamental key uh, issue for the IP right. Therefore, IP system should deserve existing even for such pandemic situation. Therefore, IP system should already be equipped with well-balanced practice, not bound by present uh, uh, even such a, such a severe situation. In the case of farm IP, I would say it is perhaps a right time to be uh, directed to the to the uh, higher level of of inventiveness, higher level of inventiveness to pharma patent, so that number of uh, patent right of the uh, innovator companies may be reducing, and their share of the patent right between innovator and 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 uh, generics uh, may be well balanced. So even if such practice uh, would be not familiar with us, uh, we would get accustomed to such practice sooner or later, just like a teleworking system nowadays, it would be a good chance to be to change necessary practice, necessary practice change. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. So, um, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Kozawa for uh, giving that insight but yes uh things are changing and uh, we need we are seeing the change in trends uh vis a vis what was envisioned and uh, if we have a uh, mr masato also uh, there on video um we can have uh, the last question that i have for all the panelists is uh, what is the uh, that you see would drive innovation like what uh, IP people can do to drive innovation for companies. So, uh, Aaron, if you have any views on what would drive uh, companies to sure. innovate, yes. Yeah, no, no problem. Well, I mean, speak, speaking from China, um, uh, I, I, I think, I think as I mentioned, it's going to be a slow to the patent office. Um, I think as we see market conditions continue to improve, there's going to be a real push to jump back to to jump back into the game as fast as possible. Now, right now, it's sort of a slow trajectory, but as the market opens up um, and they see their competitor firms starting to file, everyone's going to want to get back on the train as fast as they can. You know, with regard to to China specifically. Um, some of the main, main areas that are really starting to pop uh, right now, or certainly before COVID-19, were uh, in, the, in, the, in the financial uh, tech sector, such as mobile pay, for example. AI is always a hot topic, as is blockchain, probably everywhere in the world. And certainly with China, it's with regard to 5G. Um, I would say for those that are very interested in the Chinese sector, one of the main areas as well is certainly the healthcare sector. Before all of this happened, um, China was really pushing an initiative to have a healthy China by the year 2030. So that's in 10 years from now. So um, there's significant R&D dollars invested in pathology and disease control now, especially, but it was going to be earmarked for investment before the COVID-19 uh, issues happened. So there are a lot of healthcare reforms. Um, and so we're gonna, we, we really think that, uh, that we're going to see see the trends continue in this direction with regard to 5G, AI, um, certainly mobile pay in the tech sector, but also the healthcare sector as a whole. And again, I think it's really a waiting game. Um, right. I, that, that IP will come rearing back. It absolutely will, and we're going to see the filings coming back into Japan and India and China and elsewhere all around the world. But I think that the ability and the desire to really start filing is directly correlated with how the business is doing. And right now, as business everywhere in the world is, is pretty much running stagnant, I think that we're going to see a direct correlation between business growth and reemergence um, that, that corresponds directly to, uh, to, the, to the filing and uh, IP sectors, certainly in China, but I, I would surmise that that's accurate elsewhere as well. Right, right. So it's, it's uh, 
all the sectors that become important um, with technology we need uh, it booming and uh, with healthcare requirements we see pharma booming so uh, mr masato what do you have to say about uh, which technologies or which areas seem to be booming in uh, japan um, like which are the areas uh, companies like pharma sectors or the technology sectors are will see a good boom in japan in the current situation that uh, to make a good uh, drug uh, for coronavirus i think it's the most important and uh, you know that uh, uh, Abigan it's just a pharmaceutical drug uh, made by uh, Fujifilm. And now it's about to um, be applied to, to, to the therapy for coronavirus. Okay. And uh, yeah, so uh, nice. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, this kind of activity will be uh, aggressively done further. And uh, um, for us as patent attorney, what we can do is just to support such kind of research by filing uh, aggressively uh, patent application, uh, not only in Japan, uh, India, China, and uh, but also for all of the world. Right, right. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Kuzuwa, if you have uh, something to add on uh, is digital uh, become, will be important in Japan? Well, uh, mm, I think coronavirus uh, cannot stop the uh, uh, human innovation activity as far as uh, IP exists. IP is also uh, very important in such a very severe situation. And uh, that is a uh, uh, nature of our human being. So <laughs> they- they you need that? Yeah they are making always every effort to develop and to innovate anything. Yeah, that is our human being nature. Okay, so um, we have one question from uh, Suhas uh, regarding if uh, pharma or healthcare industry in Japan or China come up with the uh, vaccination on coronavirus, will it, will it be available to ev everyone in other countries? What do you think uh, will restrict uh, uh, the, that vaccination becoming available to other countries? So uh, Aaron, if you have anything. Sure, um, I just, uh, I, I think I just answered yes. uh, that, that answer. But I think, you know, I, I believe personally that whoever comes up with the cure, if it's an Indian company, a Japanese company, a Chinese, an American, anyone, I think the first person to come up with a viable cure for this or company to come up with a viable cure for this will be very happy to license it to everyone around the world. And I do not believe there will be any major issues for the first probably six months to a year. I think after that, there are questions with regard to distribution and, gen, you know, once the generics come in and then some further licensing issues and whatnot. Right. But I think for the first time in modern world history, certainly in all of our lifetimes, our entire world is, is united in the battle to combat this virus. So whomever comes up with it, I think that there are issues of morality and issues of global citizenship where people are more than willing to help others during this time. Exactly, so that's the reason of um, asking the question is, uh, will the moral rights hold more than the IP rights? <laughs> right. I think um, so, yeah. Yes. Um, Mr. Kuzuwa, if you have, uh, what do you think will uh, impact uh, the moral rights becoming more important uh, if a coronavirus comes up? Uh, a vaccination we have for coronavirus or the uh, other countries will be open to use it if a Japanese company comes up with the vaccination? Of course, vaccination must be 
everywhere available, even, yeah, if, if the vac vaccine uh, is come up with, uh, uh, yeah, new, new invention, but, but th those inventions are, must be available everywhere in the world, of course. Exactly. Yeah. No, no right. question. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, Dr. Masato, if you have your views. Ah, and uh, we have uh, additional information, and it's not vaccine, but uh, it's just a compound. So it's uh, Avia, uh, I mentioned, uh, under this uh, current circumstance, uh, Japanese government decided to provide an emergency grant aid worth one, uh, worth one million USD, US dollars so as to distri distribute Avigan to countries tracking the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So uh, it seems that it will be available to other countries. Yeah. Right, yeah. Right, right. Great. So I think we have um, the answers to some of the questions we had to understand how the, our neighbor countries are looking at this current situation and what they think about it. And um, thank you so much for uh, being there and participating in the panel and it was great having you. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Mr. Kuzuwa. Uh, thank you, Masato. Um, thank, you so thank you so much. It's great. Thank, thank you very you. much. Have a good and, night. A good and day. we have taken an e-picture e of our conversation. So I think we'll be able to share those pictures uh, which we have. And uh, it was great having you once again. Thank you. Good night, thank everybody. You. Yes, Bye. thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yes, over to you, Ryan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kiyoshi Kazuwa, Mr. Aaron D. Hulsworth, Mr. Uh, Dr. Masato Idea, and Ms. Aditi Galot. Uh, we now move on to our next section that uh, we'll be providing the Green Innovators Award. And uh, let me just share my screen so that we know who the innovators in the awards are being presented to. Yes. Is my screen viewable by everyone? Yes, Ryan, go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Uh, before starting off with uh, our award winners, uh, we'd like to first, uh, we'd like to be announcing the winners of this Green Innovative Award. And Legacy has recognized these award winners who have environmentally friendly products that currently exist in the market. Keeping in mind the green innovation theme, Legacy has taken the innovation initiative to help them with all their IP related work. Coming to our award winners, our first award winner would be Dr. AK Jen. The organization is Lovely Professional University. A mobile and the title is a mobile application for pump section, selection to reduce wastage of water and energy. Our next award winner is Dr. Prabir Sharkar, Professor Harpreet Singh, Mr. Hamanpreet Singh, Mr. Faith Singh, Mohammad Sahil, and Mr. Karak Singh. The organization they belong to is Indian Institute of Technology, Roper. And the title of what they've been working on is Subtle Moving Machine. Our next awardee is Mr. Jawad Patel. The organization is JP Labs. And the title of his work is Dewdrop. Our next award winner is Ms. Anupma Thakur. Organization Silco Theo. Title Waste to Clean Hydrogen Fuel. Solution to Superbugs. Our next awardee is Mr. Alan George, organization Avantgarde Innovation, title Avatar, a small wind turbine for the price of an iPhone. And the last award winner would be, sorry, uh, that sums up our award winners. Uh, we congratulate all our award winners for this commendable achievement and we'd like to have a group picture of them, please.
Ivan, I would request him to raise your hands so that I can turn on your videos. All the award winners, we request you to please turn, uh, raise your hands so that Mehek can um, start your video. Um, Han, you need to uh, stop sharing the screen so that. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. And Anupama and uh, Dr. A.K. Jan, can you switch on your cameras, please? Uh, wait. Okay, I'm trying. Yeah. One thing is for sure, COVID-19 is also going to put photographers out of business. I would request all the winners to please turn on their cameras to take a quick photograph. Uh, hello, uh, ma'am. I'm not able to get that setting of the camera on my screen. Yeah, there is some issue. Uh Okay, no problem. May I, can Ryan, may I suggest that uh, we yeah. move on and then towards the end of the event, we can request sure. uh, everyone to come back. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you. Okay, so let's move on to our next section. Um, we now welcome panel to that uh, green room. Is India really ready is the topic. And I'd like to welcome uh, Mr. Kevin Romani, CEO of Legacies. He will moderate the panel. Uh, Dr. Santosh Mohanty, Vice President and Senior Executive, Tata Consultancy Services India. He has more than 25 years of the industry research and teaching experience that includes business strategy, partner collaboration, analyst relation, corporate research and development, coaching and leadership grooming. He has a PhD in mathematical science an MS in Computational Mathematics from NIU, Illinois, USA. He has been awarded the title of Distinguished IT Architect, Professional Leader by the Ocean Group. Mr. Girish Joshi, Chief Trading Operations and Listing Sales, Bombay Stock Exchange. He was also a member of the Corporate Bonds and Securitization Advisory Committee of Securities and Exchange Board of India. He represents BSE in substantially working group of World Federation of Stock Exchange and also substantial stock exchange initiatives of the United Nations. Mr. Manish Sudan, head IP Tata Steel India. Mr. Sudan is a member of Innovation Council and works as researchers to assess and convert potential ideas into new products and technologies. He has led Tata Steel to win a number of converted and prestigious awards. The Thomson Reuters in Invitation Award 2015, the Council <laughs> of Institutional Investors National IP Award and the Tata Innovista Award in 2015 and 16. Over to you, Mr. Kevaduman. Thank you, Ryan. And uh, it was a very exciting panel discussion. Um, much to all the previous panelists. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Munish and uh, Girish Bhai. Can we uh, have it? Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So um, I just have an update from uh, Dr. Mohanty. He is actually unable to join us because of uh, some connectivity issues that he's facing. Uh, but we'll uh, continue. And uh, the minute he's able to join, we'll include him in our uh, panel discussion. 
clearly the subject of our panel discussion is uh, green growth is india really ready we know that india is a high growth economy and even in the post covid times the imf has come up with a projection that we will continue to grow at 1 to 2% the need to build a sustainable business is a given however the question remains is that do we have the technology to do that do we have the investor mindset to achieve that the typical dilemma of environment over profit continues to haunt the business leaders a lot has been spoken about the triple bottom line that's basically people planet and profit but how ready are we as businesses any opening comments over here girish bhai let's start with you uh good evening uh, thank you legacy uh, shuhas gd aditi uh, ryan and divija and all uh and thank you for giving opportunity for bsc to share this views on the very important time critical time we are going through covid pre covid and post covid because the entire paradigm is going to get shift that is a lot of apprehension and speculation is going on that what will the new business model existing business model will uh, work or not work so uh, before that you know, i think this mr modak when he started uh, set the tone in the beginning he also said innovation is ultimately uh, why why you do innovation because you want to have better sustainable business model so innovation is going in that direction and fortunately i think india also started that progress because we had lot of startups in india we had uh, no, also silicon valley in bangalore and many startups came and have made profitable business model of course they were more on the consumer e-commerce and more consumer driven uh, model but uh now this covid is giving lot of new challenge new opportunities as uh, discussed in the previous panel uh healthcare is a new area even i would feel even education education also of course we have digital education but uh, now it will get more impetus uh, through post covid scenario and lot of uh, lifestyle uh, no and even the way of doing entertainment or leisure how you going to enjoy that that new definition and new way of thing is going to come now coming to the role of stock exchange how stock exchange uh, can play uh, the supporting role because it's a platform where you raise capital entrepreneur comes to stock exchange and it uh, connects to the investors and other stakeholders so uh, before that i just want to share that in uh, at bsc we have sme platform where small and medium enterprises come and get listed and in under sme also we have uh, allowed startups to get listed so five startups companies have got listed on bac sme platform and of course in sme we have listed more than uh, uh, almost 3, 400 companies so this platform allows small companies also to raise capital even small capital of rupees 5 crore up to 10 crore also and get listed and you built up the your company and raise more further capital so platform is also there and because these companies are coming and getting listed so there is appetite by few class of investor who are willing to provide their risk capital to such enterprises now coming to the other board we call it main board where large caps companies are listed so all these companies are already they have their own running business model but uh, as uh, you know they our indian companies are also leaders in many areas in the global uh, uh, business and they are also driving sustainability business model and uh, practices in their business uh, model i would say so and for to encourage such companies to adopt more and more sustainable business model uh, we have you know done tie with gri which is a global reporting initiative or platform and we want a company to adopt gri standards and report based on gri or gri standards on gri platform we also have done tie with uh, Uh, we are member of integrated reporting council we are also member member of indian green bond council so few of the companies have listed the green bond of course in india sebi our regulator also has framed the guideline for issue of green bond and accordingly a few companies have listed that green bond in india so green uh, as a future is definitely uh, there because it is the way where 
all companies who would main, maintain their sustainable business model so i would now uh, no uh, stop my talk and uh, we'll add later on when we have further panel discussion thank you girish bhai uh, munish opening comments please yeah i hope i am audible okay okay uh, attending a virtual conference room is an experience in itself <laughs> i hope it doesn't become another normal life uh, anyhow uh, coming back to when we are talking about uh, uh, is india ready for the green growth uh, uh, my take on this is that uh, we are sort of in take off stage uh, we have put uh, ambitious goals to be achieved in terms of uh, what we are calling this ndcs and uh, sdgs compliance and in alignment with the sustainability sustainability development goals and uh, nationally determined contributions and uh, i see these very ambitious goals but because we need to understand we are talking about uh, reducing the carbon intensity almost to 30 to 35% below 2005 levels it is a very very ambitious target and that's we are also talking about increasing our renewable energy contribution almost to uh, uh, almost to 40% uh, from the current levels and restoring 26 million uh, million hectares of uh, the degraded land uh, and more importantly <clears throat> these targets need to be achieved by 2030 uh, and we need to understand uh, as you know in the previous discussions we have been discussing this that you know india is a growing economy and we are poised to become a leading economy um, and government is also thinking that manufacturing shares increases uh, in terms of the overall contribution to the gdp from the current levels of 16% to almost 25% and then we are talking about that uh, this would become 25% this would further put load on the environmental aspect in terms of uh, increase carbon footprint so if we think from you know finding out a solution that you know we need to be ready for the growth i think uh, you know we need to think from the uh, you know fundamental perspective uh, the first is we need to think about the green sources of energy uh, it's very very important and why it's very very important even in the current situation the 80% of india's uh, electricity is through fossil fuels it's it's a uh, and then you know we have a huge dependency on coal which is obvious because we are one of the second largest coal producers in the world uh, and you know we have huge dependency from the power sector from the steel sector uh, when it comes to uh, you know uh, the coal and the second is we need to focus on the green manufacturing processes uh, uh, so that you know we can we can put lesser load uh, uh, on the overall processes the second uh, the third which is very very important is that we need to orient ourselves uh, towards uh, the the green products and when we say that we need to orient ourselves i think the whole ecosystem need to uh, the orient themselves as a consumers as a manufacturers as a regulator uh, and having said that uh, you know we need to understand to make this a reality uh, I, i find there are two fundamental things that we need to understand the first is policy uh, you know which which girish also touched upon a little bit that because whenever we change to a new infrastructure new technologies uh, there would be cost implications we need to shift to new supply chains we need to shift to new platforms which would add to the cost so policy measures needs to be put in place so there is a less burden on to the adopters uh we are seeing that uh, by what's happening in the case of evs so making evs a, a mass adoption we need to have some policy measures in place and government has come up with some policy measures and second is very very important we need to uh, think about innovation uh, we need to increase our investment into the innovation uh, because if we are talking about sustainability anything which comes to anybody's mind that sustainability is equal to innovation traditionally we have been seeing innovation from two angles only uh, you know we we see that you know when we when we evaluate any particular innovation uh, the two things comes to our mind first is you know how big is uh, the market size which is getting tapped what is the market potential and the second is appropriability we look look from the exclusivity protection the ip rights protection but i think we need to bring in the third perspective and that this third perspective is going to be what sustainability the innovation the investment that we are going to make uh, to solve our existing problems 
are these innovations going to be sustainable or not? And in this evolved matrix, I think this third parameter is not going to be an optional. We need to make this as a rate controlling. Uh, and sooner the organization realizes, uh, better it, it would be. And we need to keep sustainability at the forefront when we are taking business strategy decisions. Uh, and there is a, there is a, you know, people always, you know, uh, make comparison between the, the cost. And generally, when we're talking about the sustainable solution, the cost outweighs the benefit, uh, which is a practical reality. If, if we, you know, look about around the sustainable solution, which are around the world, we will find this is the factor. But we need to think how we are addressing this concern in the long term. Uh, and of course, the economics of the green manufacturing is still evolving. We need to have some good case studies uh, to convince the stakeholders, the regulators, and internal stakeholders within the manufacturers. So, so that, that's my take. I think two, two fundamental things that we need to address, we need to talk, discuss if we need to make India uh, you know, uh, you know, ready from the green growth perspective. First, we need to think from the policy measures. And second, we need to increase our investments into innovation to the extent possible. And we need to think innovation primarily from the sustainability perspective is the investment that we are going to make in typical innovation is those innovation are those innovations going to be sustainable or not so that that would be my take um, uh, you know just to address if, if india is ready or not absolutely thank you very much munish and uh, you made an interesting point that 80 percent of electricity in this country is still fossil fuel Uh, and that's actually again you know, most major cities and uh, state governments and the central government is trying to push for electric vehicles. But the fact is, while it will drop the pollution in the cities where there is a car density, but the fact is, we'll be burning more fossil fuel elsewhere to supply the electricity to the electric vehicles. Uh, having said that, uh, my next question is for uh, Girish Bhai specifically. So you spoke about how the stock market is helping companies look at a green sustainable future. Let me ask a little related question to that. There are other stakeholders in the capital market, particularly the institutional investors in India. How are they participating in building a green future? Are you seeing an up, uptake in funds that are focused as green funds? Are you seeing investors becoming more savvy, institutional investors making decisions based on how green the company is. Uh, uh, JD, here I just want to uh, give two uh, trends globally. Uh, means in India, we have almost institutional investors, uh, mutual funds, insurance companies, banks, and others, family offices, etc. And we have foreign institutional investor also. So FPIs which are coming into India, where they are taking direct exposure to being a PE fund or venture capital fund, definitely they do consider the aspects of green, uh, sustainability, uh, environment friendly, and accordingly they allocate the fund and they commit and they support also. And even they know, particularly what is happening in the new startups or new generation business model which have come. And uh, regarding portfolio investment, uh, portfolio investment also coming mainly from these investors, FPI, as well as our institute, domestic institutional investors. So there, um, I would say trend is not so encouraging. It is there, but it is very minuscule. Very few domestic institutional investors would look at uh, environment aspects, particularly environment and social aspects or uh, pollution aspects. They will look more governance aspect. Governance aspect is more because our governance norms are very stringent. We come in the top three countries in the world for corporate governance because fortunately, SEBI has made a corporate governance standards of for India in corporate India very high. So corporate governance is screened very thoroughly by all investors when they you know, uh, make any investment or allocate funds. But as far as environment social aspect is concerned, uh, it is uh, very small and many very few pockets. Those uh, cases where no, even they have JV partner, which are foreign entities and they are insisting. So accordingly, they will make their portfolio allocations and it will be all very selective because uh, everyone wants to prove that they want to you know, outperform the benchmark indices and they want to give better yield to the ultimately retail investors. So uh, that has not uh, 
got that sizable attention i just want to draw you know one two example like as you no know, bsc has taken the lead on this space way back in 2012 where bsc was the first exchange to sign sustainable stock exchange initiative uh, from the entire uh, asia and followed that we also launched to one indices green green x and we also uh, uh, launched another indices with help of uh, british government and it was uh, s and uh, snp carbonx so two indices also we have but not a fund has come that we want to launch one active fund or passive fund on these two indices even we were ready to tweak our indices and methodology and of course um, it has been of course it is there in public forum and all the places in the long run such indices give better return compared to the benchmark indices so these are those investors which are coming on the equity market now coming to the bond because uh, enterprises need both type of capital equity capital as well as debt capital so when when even you want to raise the debt capital as i said earlier our uh, sebi has made green bond uh, guideline so very few companies have come out with the green bond uh, majority companies are coming with the regular bond and uh, again when investor are choosing to so they look only the credit aspects so even uh, i'm not sure whether you know, how rating agency also factor into ens aspects into when they build the rating so people cho normally choose the rating investors and how it is visa vis the sovereign uh, bond rate, uh, yield and they try to bench price the bond so even for fixed income i would say there is not much progress uh, uh, here in uh, you no know, where investor would try to consciously allocate the fund for such enterprises which are encouraging sustainability green uh, uh, innovations and they will allocate some fund in such a, even though they feel may not be return in the immediate future but in the long run such firms will outperform even if you uh, means uh, we have evidence empirically even entities which have raised money through green bond they have to price their bond at the same yield visa with the normal bond means they are not getting even small concession based of small bips even i would say no quarter paisa or one paisa in their yield visa with a normal bond so uh, it is it has started in a little bit but it is not in a full fledged that all uh, not uh, there is a competition among the fund houses that this is my fund this fund has outperformed uh, and on this fund uh, this much aum we are you know you of this aum this much aum is allocated based on the and on theme of sustainability environment social aspects and green so that competition should be there among the fund houses to prove and show their returns or aum based on such uh, good practices i would say so desired practices in the terms of esg thank you very much uh, girish bhai i mean that was very insightful i think uh, esg is a good parameter to uh, focus on and uh, funds kind of competing with each other that is good uh but let's shift gears a little bit uh munish let's talk about the steel industry perspective i mean we all know steel is producing steel is very energy hungry and it's one of the leading uh, co2 emitting industry uh how is how is the indian steel industry and maybe the global steel industry working on solving this issue so uh, jadeep uh, and making green growth a reality uh, is not an option for us as a steel industry and also as a country and let me just give you the facts uh, we are the third largest you know polluting industry in the world uh, of the power and the road industry uh, the steel industry which contributes almost 7% of the overall co2 emitted in the environment uh, that's the first thing and second uh, second thing is that as a country we are the fourth largest polluters after china uh, united state uh, uh, and uh, the the uh, uh, core europe we are the fourth largest co2 emitters uh, in, in the world so when we are talking about that green growth and given the the scenario that we are talking about that we need to become leading economy in the world i think we we need to start focusing on that you know how we are targeting this problem now coming back to the steel industry uh, there are already stringent norms which have been put in place in uh, european uh, regime uh, and if you are producing co2 beyond a particular limit 
you need to pay per ton of steel. The current situation here is you need to pay more than 50 euro per ton of steel if you are uh, going beyond a particular CO2 limit which has been set as per the different uh, parameters in place. Now, having said that, the industry has come together. The whole industry has come together. I'll talk about examples uh, from Tata Steel itself, the kind of investment that we are making to make it a reality. And also from the global perspective, the companies are thinking about, they're challenging the fundamental assumptions about the steel making itself. When we talk about steel making, uh, a basic technologist would understand that, you know, it needs two basic ingredients. Uh, one is iron ore and the second is the coal. And there's a huge dependency upon the coal and the coal contributes the major, uh, the pollutant uh, when we talk about the steel industry. Now, companies have started targeting, can we have a steel making without coal and coke? This is as simple as that. And the initiatives on this front have moved uh, on a very, very advanced stages. You know, these have moved to, if I'm talking about in technology readiness level, to six to seven levels. Uh, like, you know, we have technology like molten oxide electrolysis, which doesn't, uh, which only is based upon the electricity. This hybrid, which totally talks about steel making based upon hydrogen. And hydrogen, that too, through the green resources. It needs to be green hydrogen. If you're taking hydrogen again through the natural gas or the fossil fuels, the, the purpose is defeated on the green growth perspective. So the companies have started working around this, all these green initiatives in fact, you know, we are working on a technology, uh, Hisana, which is almost now 15 years old, and it's in the advanced stages, which reduces the carbon footprint uh, percentage almost to the 40%. So the industry has come together. They are collaborating on these initiatives so that uh, we can move towards, uh, you know, zero emitter industry in the world. So the, the cap is just not incremental 10% or 20%. The whole industry is looking towards the breakthrough. Oh, very valid. I think that was a question that came through the audience as well. I think uh, you answered much more than that question. Uh, let, me, uh, let me ask a simple question. Obviously, you're trying to do all of this and uh, there are constraints, constraints that you face in accomplishing this. Uh, could you talk us through some of the constraints that you're facing? And if you could add a little bit color to that in terms of uh, certain regulatory constraints that are facing, maybe supply chain constraints or uh, constraints of uh, implementing, I mean, is it CapEx heavy? Uh, a perspective on that would be uh, good, Manish. Yeah, so, uh, and I'll talk with generic Will and we'll take some example of steel industry also when we are talking about the CapEx and all those things. Number of studies have been taken when we are people shifting from, you know, typical steel making to an alternate iron making or alternate steel making technologies. The capex requirements approximately, you know, you need more than 50% of your current requirements to almost 100%. So that's a kind of shift that you need to talk about. And I'm pretty sure that this kind of capex requirements do come in other industries also when they're shifting gears towards green growth. So we need to understand here the policy may need to play a very, very fundamental role. And second, we need to understand whether it's steel industry, whether it's a chemical industry, or whether it's FMCG industry, buying green is too pricey for an average consumer. Uh, we, we can do you know, studies in India, we can still do studies in the US, Europe, we can talk about different products right from the straws to the, the paper cups and everything. We'll find that the, the, the green products are expensive in the current situation. And we need to understand very, very deeply why these are uh, expensive. It's primarily because the supply chains for the green initiatives are not there. The platforms are not there. The, the systems uh, is not there. The mass adoption is not there. The volume demand is not there. And that's the basic reason. To make that happen, uh, you know, there's often a battle between, you know, what you say, the, the government and the manufacturers. And, you know, government is pushing that, you know, manufacturers need to reduce the CO2 footprint. They need to come up with a sustainable product. Often there's a battle between what you call consumer activists and the government and many times between the consumer activists and as well as with the organizations. And people are, people are talking about that it can't be done on a voluntary basis. You need to have legislation in place. And there's another group which moves the, uh, the concept that you know, we need to educate, we need to make uh, the, the whole ecosystem aware that this is the scenario and this is how it is going to impact. 
well, I'm not denying that legislation is important or the awareness is not important, but we need to understand the practical reality from the manufacturer's perspective also to make these things happen. We need a collective effort. We have SDGs in place. We have in different um, treaties, which, is, which are done at the global level, uh, among the manufacturers, among the countries. One fundamental thing which I find there is no effective standard measure which is put in place. How different countries are progressing on that particular front. One practical scenario which I'll just talk about. Of course, you know, European uh, legislation, they have put a cap that if you are emitting CO2 beyond a particular limit, you need to pay for that. But you now companies are started talking about what about the import? So because the world doesn't belong to a particular territory. The world, you know, whole universe comes together as a, as, a, as, a, as a land. So we can't segment that, you know, because a particular piece is not manufactured from here, it's compliant, CO2 compliant or not. So we need to talk about the effective measures in place. They need to be indicators and these indicators need to be monitored and they need to be discussed and maybe at, at some time, these need to be also enforced. So, uh, the practical constants are there, uh, even in spite, in spite of all the facts that companies many times do have technologies, but they are finding it very, very hard to compete in the market if they go with the sustainable product, if they go with the sustainable processes. You're right. Uh, I mean, the world clearly doesn't belong to anybody. We've seen that borders mean nothing. Correct. <laughs> Absolutely. Wildfire. I mean, before anyone could realize it was a global phenomenon. But Girish Bhai, you work with a lot of uh, promoters, a lot of board of directors, investment committees. Uh, when they are trying to raise funds, keeping future growth in mind, I'm sure they talk about green, sustainable. But I'm sure through the conversations, a lot of uh, constraints emerge. What's your view through those conversations that you have? What are the constraints Indian businesses are facing to become green and become sustainable? Uh... Uh, the Indian many problems like you know, if you see our top 50 companies or top 100 companies, many companies have done very good initiative on supply chain. Also, they are insisting from the vendors and supplier, no, you follow these practices, otherwise, we will not uh, buy your product or we will not supply to you. But when they have to raise money, uh, so here the of course, promoters are willing to uh, disc, you know, they are showing the good practices, just. Uh, just digressing a little bit talk like on we have on our website we have sustainable reporting portal so you know we are telling company you know start uh, put publish your sustainable report so investor would uh, read your report and try to allocate good quality capital or at least you get pre first preference when they want to commit fund to india or to any of your further capital expansion so even more than 25 companies are currently reporting on bac sustainable reporting for last three years it has not gone beyond uh, 25. So, of course, there are many companies. But when uh, these owners, promoters, or senior management person of these companies, they, uh, they come to the market, whether domestic or global, and they say, now we need this much million dollars or this much ca capital for our future growth. So, unfortunately, they have to always uh, first show the return, uh, pure financial numbers. And a very, uh, I doubt you know, if any query comes from those investors, you know, how much, what precaution you're taking on the green side, you know, how your business model is there. Because uh, views of the investor is very short term. At times, uh, they uh, don't want to commit very long term. Uh, so, so and, and that's the compels promoters or owners also to try to tell the investor what is the, you know, good for them in short term. So when you try to project the picture in short term, you naturally you have to say what will be the cash flow, what will be the, your positive you know, ROE. So they will not talk, no, no, this is my first ROE, this will be my ROE after factoring the cost of sustainability or green uh, future or green investments which I'm making. So that aspect is missing. Uh, it is, I'm sure it is not there for India, it is there for all many countries which are there from emerging market, whether it's Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, everyone is facing the same issue because we are capital scarce country, we need more capital 
so investors whoever investor is attractive based on based better yield they money will come first so that is the trend uh, that is i am again talking about portfolio investment uh, even uh, direct investment uh, some uh, which is coming through startups uh, so many pe fund or venture capital funds are coming that that uh, we have seen so some funds are very conscious they will not cut the checks unless until they they analyze the social impact of the project what is the impact on the society how the green this project is then they commit the fund so i i would say it is uh, challenge is there for our promoters and entrepreneurs who are very much serious about this and they want to raise capital based on such theme but I, they may not get that much response from the investors particularly domestic investors they may get the some response from the overseas investors but i'm not i'm sure they may not get from domestic investors now uh, just uh, coming to the second aspect we are talking about investors we have another organized uh, entity called banks who are lending through the central bank and even we have to see their framework when they are doing onward lending to any big, big enterprises or even small and medium enterprises who are in hardcore manufacturing where they are also analyzing this aspects okay you know actually what is the business model how environment friendly how green it is you know whether and that basis this model is more sustainable so uh, what mr munish said no the entire ecosystem has to move in at a same point of time then we get the desired results if only one section is working which currently is only top the leading enterprises no top 50 to 100 companies which are doing and not across the all companies including all no, small and business enterprises then uh, there is a challenge because to make a green future uh, in a desired way we we are, we are on the right path and we have our own indigenous way of making innovation may not straight away copy from the abroad our all uh, so many it is happening more on the agri side i would say agri based innovations are so much happening in india only thing whether they are getting the right capital to scale it up so they support the entire supply chain it is happening in few very few pockets where only and uh, so this enterprise or this heroes should be encouraged and they should have scalable business model so large capital flow comes to them thank you thank you girish bhai and a quick welcome to uh, dr marshalkar uh, in this digital testing it's uh, thank you so much for joining us sir give us a few minutes we are going to wrap this panel and uh, then we'll move on to the fireside conversation thank you um so i think there is a question from one of the audience uh, by vivek kanwar i'm going to read it out uh, the answer vivek is obvious but uh, it will be great to get the views of monish and uh, girish as well so the question is uh, sir as we are talking about green technologies should we um should we focus on renewable energy for producing electricity as india has a lot of hydroelectric and solar energy power resources uh, is it good to invest in renewable energy resources uh, i'm sure this is not a question from a stock market investment perspective because this is not that forum uh, so wh while we have girish bhai from bsc yeah, that question is not from that perspective munish and girish your perspective on businesses trying to invest into renewable energy resources please so uh, my quick take on this yes of course that that's a future and there's no question of saying no uh, even from the government or, or the, from the industry perspective and we need to understand that on renewable energy front uh, india is already a success story in fact you know given the given the performance that uh, the country has shown on the renewable energy front the the targets have been revised what we saw in the ndcs so uh, Um, the the industry the companies are thinking about uh, uh, you know taking this on a forefront in a bigger way we also need to understand you know when a lot of renewable energies that we are talking about like hydrogen and all those things or you know evs we need to understand that we need to talk about the cyclic nature of uh, the energy how this energy is getting harvested 
So many times we are talking about EVs, electrical vehicles, but we are not able to understand that uh, the, the electricity is getting produced through the coal or through the natural gas. So the fossil fuels come up in some way at some place. So the, the net impact is not uh, you know, reducing the overall carbon footprint. So we need to talk about that. We need to have, uh, when we're talking about renewable energy, we need to have a complete cycle where we are able to harvest the energy in best environmentally friendly fashion. That's the, going to be very, very critical for us. Uh, no, in renewable energy, um, it's, uh, of course, smart money, smart capital is there. I uh, mean, people are getting good uh, fund, uh, particularly on the, so, uh, I would say, solar also. A lot of money has come into India and we have very good successful stories also. And uh, people are raising not even through equity, a lot of debt capital also come in such sector. Right. And, and uh, when you say debt capital, naturally you have to give return. If it is equity capital is okay, no, return is different. But when it's debt capital, then naturally you have to generate that much cash flow and given money back to those investors. So there is a future. We have so many new entrepreneurs uh, who have worked. These are all, I would say, IITs type of people who have worked in, abroad. They understood those concepts and they are supporting India and they have done a lot of very big uh, scale expansion on renewable energy. Uh, only thing, how this is being given to entire industries in a more affordable way, that is the big challenge because that much support also has to be given to these producers to the distribution. Because the distribution is very important and uh, to the entire ecosystem because every industry needs those power. So how will ensure that power is being given to those each and every small industries where all industrial hubs and they take this energy. So, and then it becomes, you know, it reduces your cost of production and it becomes more viable solution. Hello. Jai Deep, Jai Deep. Uh, I was on mute. Thank you very much. There is a question from uh, the audience and I'll give a little backdrop to that. Uh, so India is facing about uh, a loss of $80 billion every year due to environmental degradation. Uh, that's roughly close to 6% of our GDP. I mean, of course, the previous GDP, pre-COVID-19 -pre GDP. Um, and the question is that should the government offer incentives and subsidies for green businesses uh, while they do it in uh, bits and spurts, um, like bringing out an incentive for electric vehicles. Uh, from an intellectual property perspective, I mean, the session is about intellectual property and green future and all. How should uh, the government incentivize and promote businesses that are focused on developing green capital, green businesses, much more than what they are doing today? Please, by Manish, your comments, please. So uh, that, that's a very relevant, and I'll give you some stats. And uh, pardon me if my figures are, you know, these are rough figures, but you know, uh, and this this is for the company which are listed in the Bombay Stock Exchange. Uh, only the company which are listed in the Bombay Stock Exchange. Uh, I'm talking about figures about 16, 17, and 17, 18. Approximate uh, Indian companies have paid 1600 crore rupees, at just for the sake of royalty. Uh, to, to the, the counterparts in US or in Europe. That's a kind of figure. And you can imagine that if we collectively take the figures, the company which are not listed in Bombay Stock Exchange and other companies, the figure would be much bigger. So uh, definitely we need to create some incentives and the mechanism how, uh, how we can really uh, uh, propagate the innovation, how we can nurture those innovation. And in fact, uh, the Indian government has come up with these incentives. Uh, so if, if um, I, I think many, many of the IP professionals might be aware, if you have IP and if it has come from the startups, you have either different kind of incentives. And in case, even, even you're a big company and you are able to uh, get revenue from that particular IP from outside country, there's a different tax implication altogether. So government has come up with some framework, but I think this needs to be further enlarged. This needs to be given further push and from the time perspective, I find uh, this new impetus towards green future is of great advantage to a developing country like us because it's giving us a level playing field. And I'm telling you why level playing field because 
the whole world is thinking of recalibrating their business strategy so it's kind of a love all uh, stage where you know every every country every organization has to start at some stage and uh, we are not we can't be laggards in this i think the first movers will have advantages and when we are talking about compliance compliance with say whether it could be stgs or ndcs or meeting the ndcs i think this compliance should be taken as a opportunity uh, before you know enforcement takes uh, is us there before enforcement starts acting and you know start forcing us that we need to comply with that because first movers are going to have advantages on this front right thank you uh so at this point i think uh, we are coming close to uh, the time allotted for this panel uh, very interesting i think we can uh, continue with a lot of questions but uh, clearly there's an opportunity for india to seize uh, not just by going green but also from a gdp perspective uh, any closing comments uh, girish bhai munish bhai i would say this uh, opportunity is there for india because we, it is said indians have a lot of brain okay of course uh, always indians are next to jewish indian brain is the best that is the saying people say so we have brain uh, means how to channelize those resources and you know how to get best out of that that is very important and the same brain when they go abroad they outperform and here so you create appropriate environment Uh, so naturally you will get the same result also here in india and this uh, green future it is quite possible in india nothing uh, say impossible because when you look at the we are able to do on satellites so we are far ahead come you know, we are equivalent to all those developed nations when in terms of launching satellite so why not in terms of actual manufacturing and other areas so i don't think there is a we cannot do this only appropriate framework is to be uh, enable what was you know asked in the previous question you know, whether tax incentive or something money goes to in that channel whether you create proper etf where you no know, money is only going to such company and some tax incentive so little little retail investors money is also coming or something like you create a bank fd structure in such a way that that money is also onward lended by banks to the green enterprises so that sort of framework is to be created so end to end you no know, it is always green and that way people know what is the way how it is being done so i don't think i am very positive about this i am sure this covid has given us an opportunity and we'll be able to come out we'll be able to perform very well i am very hopeful for that Uh, thank you munish closing comments please uh, so uh, i would say the the current economic system that we have in place it has put too much load uh, on the mother earth and uh, we need to recalibrate it it's very simple and when we are talking about recalibrating this whole economic system we need to understand that the simple solution is innovation uh, and for innovation we need leadership and talent and i think india is definitely geared up we, we have all the resources in terms of leadership and talent and this is the right time that we we capture uh, the space and take it forward excellent sir thank you very much and um, bang on the dot uh, girish bhai munish sir thank you so much for joining us and uh, making this a very interesting panel discussion we of course miss dr mohanty but he has sent his regards for all of us over here and the attendees thank you again uh, over to you ryan Thank you. Thank you, Val. I like all our panelists to stay on for a moment so that we can take a group picture, please. Thank you. Thank you. A big thank you to Dr. Santosh Mohanty, Mr. Girish Joshi, and Mr. Manish Sudan, and Mr. Keval Ramani. Thank you so much. Thank you. I will just share my screen now for the next round. I hope my screen is viewable by everyone. Thank you. Yes, Go ahead. Yeah, I can see that. 
And now we move on to have our awards for our participants in the Green Innovation Hackathon event. Legacies acknowledges these award winners who have developed new ideas and have been innovative, keeping in mind green innovation as the theme. Legacies has taken the initiative to help them with all their IP related work as well. Let me announce our first award winner in the IP Hackathon section. Our first winner is Ashwin Goyal, Organization Indian Institute of Technology, Ropar, Saitil Albin. Our next award winner is Prakash Saxena, Pranjali Jain, Isha Singh. Organization Lovely Professional University, titled System and Method Rapid Testing of Soil Characteristics. Our next award winner is Mr. Vinay Ghai, Organization Indian Institute of Technology, Roper, and the title is Super Hydrophobic Eco Friendly Vacuum Bags. Our last and final award winner is RM Madhusudan, Organization HCL, titled Green Logistics. We congratulate all our award winners for their great contribution to Planet Earth, and we'll have a round of pictures towards the end for all our award winners. Thank you so much. I now like to move on to our panel three fireside conversation, and the topic would be purpose of IP post COVID-19. I'd like to welcome Mr. Suhas Tuljapulkar, founder and director, Legacies. Dr. R. A. Marshalkar, National Research Professor, Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, India. Dr. R. A. Marshalkar is uniquely manifested. Multifaceted, sorry. In 1998, he received the JRD Tata Corporate Leadership Award, an exclusive honor reserved for Indian corporates. In 1998, he also elected Fellow of the Royal Society, the topmost honor reserved for the world's path breaking scientists. Professor Anil Gupta, I am Ahmedabad and IIT Bombay faculty, founder of Honeybee Network, Shristi. NIF and GAIN. He's a pioneer in the area of, area of grassroots innovation. He's the founder of Honeybee Network. He retired as a full-time professor at the Indian Institute of Management and the Bath in 2017, where he served for about 36 years. Over to you. Good evening, everybody, uh, and thank you very much for participating in the in this event. Uh, my job is very simple. I, I don't have to introduce Dr. Mashelkar. I don't have to introduce Professor Gupta, because I think both of them are so well known today that uh, there is no requirement of any introduction that is that is there. Uh, we are going to focus on a fireside conversation between Dr. Mashalkar and Anil Gupta. And honestly, I have a very little or no role to play in this. Because what they are going to talk about and their conversation is going to ignite not only us today as the audience, like both of them have ignited at least three or four generations in past, and they're going to ignite future generations and keep everybody so motivated on the innovation in future on something which is always on the right side. Um, I'm just going to request Dr. Marsh to have taught it and then request uh, Professor Gupta. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks to both of you. Over to you, sir. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor and uh, pleasure to participate uh, in this event. Uh, organized uh, by Regusis. I think uh, I have very fond memories of the last event that you had, uh, where you honored me with uh, uh, a very, very special uh, award. I deeply appreciated that. Well, uh, based on the conversation we had yesterday, uh, we are going to cover topics like uh, green chemistry, circular economy, uh, IP, the changing landscape, particularly 
post covid so since this is going to be kind of a fireside chat i'll make a a few comments and uh, then i will pass it on to anil and then i'll come back so it will be kind of a back and forth this is not going to be just uh, uh, one way street so let me start uh, with a big perspective uh, my mind goes back to year 2003 i was uh, the president of indian national science academy and we have this uh, famous blackett memorial lecture and lord martin rees the president of royal society gave that lecture and the title of his lecture was 21st century the last century he said 21st century the last century and uh, he uh, sort of projected a very bleak future in terms of uh, human made as well as natural made calamities that included climate change ozone layer depletion ravaging of biodiversity of course in 2003 he did not know what will happen in 2020 the pandemic otherwise you would have also talked about new pandemics of the kind that we are talking about some people now call it world war 3 and uh, the difference between world war 2 is that only some countries were affected whereas here 200 plus countries uh-huh. are affected against a common uh, enemy now uh, in that context actually uh a theme like green chemistry clean chemistry sustainable chemistry becomes very important because the future has to be green uh, we talk about low carbon economy no carbon economy uh, carbon neutral homes uh, carbon neutral cities and uh, so on and uh, so forth uh if you don't have green chemistry the disasters uh, uh can be uh, many folds Uh, some will be slow and some will be uh, very rapid and sudden and i have been a witness uh, to one uh, when we had this bhopal disaster uh, when methyl isocyanate uh, uh, leaked out and 2400 people were dead instantly and uh, i remember being on the accident tank just uh, within 72 hours because i was asked to be the technical assessor for the inquiry commission and i have seen not only the devastation but the reason is caused it and uh, uh, we kept on saying no more bhopal no more bhopal that's the worst disaster that uh, one could uh, ever have but that was a sudden disaster and if you don't have green chemistry if you don't have uh, a green way of doing things then i think there is a uh, big big challenge now uh, uh, you uh, have uh, at a very fundamental level a uh, number of things that we talk about and the three that stand out uh, when it uh, uh, comes uh, to sustainability uh, and connecting with uh, uh, i would say uh, the uh, topic uh, of green chemistry one is atom economy you know we are used to agriculture economy manufacturing economy knowledge economy in this particular case we talk about atom economy then we are shifting our focus to bio economy and finally to circular economy so these are going to be the three key words uh, by the way now in terms of uh, atom economy i remember my gandhi engineering getting more from less for more and that uh, is the essence here that how every atom is used to create a product so that there are no by product there are no waste that you have to deal with and chemists are great at that i mean i would profane if you see the efficiencies of conversion which were around 40% the yields are now 99.5% this so uh, i think that human ingenuity is going to be important the other part is going to be in terms of uh, there are several strategies and one of them is uh, renewable resources uh, using that so we will not talk about refineries but bio refineries and uh, we will not talk about uh, hydrocarbon based economy but carbohydrate based uh, economy because they are perennial and uh, there i think uh, the major challenges as a scientist that i see are uh, first of all 
uh, what is the conversion efficiency of capture of light energy photosynthesis, which is less than 2%. Uh, can we give a grand challenge to increase it many fold? Can engineered genes from plants and photosynthetic bacteria increase the efficiency? Can we manipulate genes involved in nitrogen fixation to increase biomass uh, content many poles? Can plants be engineered for rapid growth with drought and high and low temperature stress? And can co-regulation of lignin and cellulose biosynthesis be achieved so that lignin content can uh, be dramatically reduced and cellulose content uh, uh, can be dramatically increased? So I believe this Breakthroughs in plant sciences will be fundamental to doing that. And tools like CRISPR, Cas9, and uh, so on are going to uh, be very, very uh, sort of uh, critical. Uh, the other issue will be when it comes to uh, bioeconomy based on carbohydrate-based uh, uh, feedstocks is uh, that we require integrative schemes, whether they are plant genetics, uh, with their uh, biochemistry, biotechnology, biomass conversion, process engineering, separation technology. And lastly, at a systems level, uh, companies which produce fuels and energy uh, have to uh, partner with companies which produce chemicals and materials, and they have to partner with those who are in agriculture, agro marketing, the food chain, etc. So it's a uh, very interesting sort of systems integration. The simple point I tried to make uh, when Anil said, let's begin by talking about uh, uh, green chemistry uh, and circular economy before we come to the IP issues. I thought I will state the same right. Now, as I said, atom economy is one. Bioeconomy, I just now described. Uh, let me say a few words about circular economy. You know, it is very clear that the previous uh, idea of uh, take, make, and dispose uh, is going to go away. And this uh, famous cradle to grave has to move from uh, cradle to uh, uh, cradle. And I believe the fundamentals there will be not uh, just selling products or buying products, but buying or selling performance, as well as designing products for regeneration and extreme levels of innovation and efficiency will be at the heart. So I'm setting the stage for uh, uh, this issue of uh, uh, green chemistry integrated, uh, of course, uh, through atom economy and bioeconomy uh, with the elements of uh, circular economy. And after hearing uh, Anil's uh, uh, views, uh, we move on to the core issue with regard to IP in this space and what we do. Anil. very much. Uh, I will pick up from where you ended, which is the circular economy and the way it is going to change the way we design business and define our relationship. It's very clear that the common people have practiced circular economy from time immemorial. I remember when I was a child, we lived in old Delhi, very small room. A lot of people is to, to, to stay in a small house. And when we went to the market, there were no envelopes at that time, no bags, no plastic bag was there at that time. Even paper bags were costly. So the shopkeeper will take a piece of paper, put the things in it, wrap it, and tie a small piece of thread around it. We will bring it back, and my grand uncle will say, okay, take the things out. He will spread the piece of paper under the bag, and hang that piece of thread on a nail. So next time we have to give something to somebody, we will use that piece of paper and that piece of thread. Not even a meter of thread was wasted. I think this is the culture, this is the value with which we have grown. And suddenly we see in the last 30 years, 40 years or 50 years, so much of junk that has gone into the oceans, that has gone into the mountains, that has gone into the rivers. And what is very remarkable about COVID-19, just a month of 
COVID-19 lockout, just one month of lockout has shown tremendous power of healing of rivers. Rivers have become cleaner, amazingly cleaner. Air has become cleaner. Sky is very clear. Now you can see the stars in the cities where earlier it was almost impossible because of light and the dust pollution. So the, and then you can hear the sounds of the bird in the daytime, which what we're saying is it takes long time to destroy nature, but nature has so much capacity to heal, it can heal very fast. So we must recognize that there is a limit to what nature can heal, but still within that limit, there's a huge choice available to us. And it is important for us then to recognize that the innovations which help nature heal will have to be fast-tracked, will have to be prioritized. And we will have to somehow marry the open source with the IP system. In other words, if people want to use an innovation for their own livelihood, make it open source. But if somebody wants to commercialize it, then you take a license. So when we practice this concept of technology commons, which Honeybee Network developed and, and I have practiced it, all the innovations for which we filed patent, more than 1,000 patents are filed. If some farmer copied that innovation, no restrictions whatsoever. We had decided no case will be filed against another fellow farmer if he copies the technology. But if a firm copies it, if a tractor company copies it, if a manufacturing company copies it, we must proceed. So we will have to think of new ways in which we encourage people to people learning. We encourage green economy. So if there are innovations which can have tremendous impact on repurposing, recycling, reusing of the waste, can we make them available to the larger society as we discussed with Dr. Mishankar yesterday, that can we have a fund which will acquire that patent, compensate the innovator and make that innovation available to a large number of small enterprises so that they can all incorporate that innovation and reduce their signature on the environment and make their system green. So the manufacturing will become green. There will be less effluents. That means there will be less problem that nature has to heal. Nature will continuously heal itself. There's a threshold value. There's a homeostatic potential of any living system. And both developmental and physiological homeostasis have ranges within which system can recoil to its own shape. We must keep those disturbances within those limits. So that is second possibility that we should try to see how green innovations get fast tracked. How can innovations which can reduce the load on nature be fast tracked? And not just fast tracked, we must also explore how can they become accessible, affordable and available to the poor, to the small enterprise. It is very clear that long distance supply chains can get disrupted very easily. We all now see the consequence of that. But short distance supply chains will continue to work. A small trader nest drawer is making us survive. You buy things from a trader who had the inventory for a few months and therefore he's able to survive our need. Long distance travel is stopped. So hardly any goods are moving. So therefore it is very important that the short distance supply chain, the local loops, local economy, which Gandhiji always talked about, is becoming more buoyant, is becoming more regenerative, is becoming more uh, sustainable, and we invest in more. But these economies would need a lot of innovation. The last point I want to make is something we tried recently and have done it in a pilot basis. We took down 0.8 million, 0.8 million abundant patents of US, PTO, and put them in a common database. So if you go to gyan, G-I-A-N dot O-R-G slash patent dot PHP, you can access 0.8 million patents without any cost, without any registration. What did we do during COVID? We put all the patents of abundant patents for ventilators and shared it with everybody who wanted, with Mahindras, with whosoever we came to know was working on ventilators, we sent a spreadsheet to them. There were 1,200 patents on different kinds of viral controls, different agents of viral control for COVID. We shared them with as many people as we could with CSIR, with other labs that could have used this knowledge. So we need to now see that there is a, there is a clear case for marrying open source with IP protection. I mean, the world will survive. You can see that there's a lot of pressure. I remember when there was a swine flu, bird flu, US had threatened the company, German company, which were not giving the medicines, Tamiflu in enough quantity. 
they said we will use the compulsory license against you now the country which was the most of greatest opponent of compulsory license had threatened another european country which was at that moment not supplying enough tablet for that purpose so we have now learned three or four lessons and that is the that with, with i will conclude and then we will discuss one the role of state has become paramount no matter what we do the state will have to play a very important role so those who thought that private sector can take care of every problem sorry there are problems which will arise which will be beyond the reach of any one private sector or group of private sector to take care second the fluctuation in the environment are going to become more frequent whether because of climate change because of market disruption because of pandemic whatever other reasons the fluctuation will become more rampant third if you look at the map of covid cases in india northeast and southeast and eastern part of india has very few cases northwest and southwest has the majority of the cases 90% cases are in this region why because the regions which are rich in nature somehow have more diversity and unfortunately also poverty have much less cases of covid so we can learn something frugality will have to be part of our life just because we have resources doesn't mean we should consume them all we can use them as a trustee for the larger social good and enjoy that process last point is sir that both from the point of view of green chemistry and circular economy they directly impinge on nature's ability to heal itself we call it i call it autopoiesis model of innovation autopoiesis is self correcting self designing self governing so if nature is allowed to i mean we had this was an experiment done in 1974 in rajasthan if you close 100 hectare of degraded land do nothing else it regenerates itself just by reducing the grazing pressure so nature has enormous capacity to regenerate itself i don't know whether anybody would like it but i would say every year if we can have week or two of lockout people will the elderly generation the grandparents will love to have grandchildren around them and they will do a lot of conversations so families will heal nature will heal economy will also heal because you know there lot of people will learn to live with less and with neighborhood economy so i think there's a there is a call that i am making at this occasion we should have two weeks lockout every year for nature to take rest and recuperate thank you so much thank you <laughs> thank you anil uh, you are a provocative uh, always <laughs> and come out with some brilliant uh, original idea uh let me carry on from where we left i think uh, uh you know this uh, covid-19 has taught us lots of lessons and people are talking about recovery recovery to what what we were or do we want to be something different so we have to reinvent ourselves i will change the word recovery to reinvent okay and we have to create a new word elements of which uh, you just now mentioned uh, quite a few of them that's the first point the second point is that uh, uh, for the audience uh, uh, i want to share some of my own experiences regard to the ip issues intellectual property issues because this session is all about uh, sort of ip uh, the major challenge uh, that comes up is when you have inequalities of income of wealth etc you have inequalities in terms of uh, uh, access uh, and uh, uh, affordability uh, and so on now so debate normally therefore turns out into intellectual property rights and i have always said it is not intellectual property rights versus the rights of the poor intellectual property rights and the rights of the poor. because the inventors innovators who have created those inventions have uh, uh, the right to get returns uh, and fair returns i would say uh, not unfair returns and the society has the right to uh, get the benefit now our past experience is the following and i can tell you from my global experience i have been a member of uh, uk commission on intellectual property rights that was set up for this very purpose of how uh, uh, you know it doesn't be on a back of one versus the other but one and the other uh, in terms of inclusive uh, sort of society which enjoys the benefits of uh, all creations 
Then I was uh, vice chair of the WHO Commission on Intellectual Property Rights, Innovation and Public Health. Madame Rudraf was the former president of Switzerland, was the chairperson. And I was also the chairman of World Intellectual Property Organization's Standing Committee, with 176 nations participating. So if I call all my experience together, what I find is that uh, you, uh, you have traveled also very extensively. When it comes uh, to, let us say, memorandum of understanding uh, between different uh, nations, uh, which they occasionally have, uh, finally, uh, uh, in letter they are written, but in spirit they are not uh, accepted. For example, I'll just give one example. Like Montreal Protocol was signed because ozone layer depletion that was being caused by chlorofluorocarbons like prion 12, prion 22 was causing a problem. And Montreal Protocol said that technologies uh, which will replace uh, these chlorofluorocarbons will be shared. IP will be shared. It was not done. And I remember as a director general of CSR, I had this IICT work for eight to nine years to create HFC 1348, which was licensed finally to Sridham. And then uh, we got uh, uh, sort of access to that. So I think in the coming era now, post COVID era, we have to reach that understanding. That is point number one. Point number two, there was a talk about startups and so on and so forth. And the startups are coming up in all those areas uh, where they're uh, easy money, this, that, and the other. But uh, we have uh, this challenge about uh, uh, Greek startups. Because by definition, in terms of, uh, you know, if you are uh, in the digital space, in the e-commerce space, etc., the journey is quick, uh, very quick. Whereas if you are in green tech, the journey is uh, sort of uh, tenuous. And then uh, you, you don't require venture capital, you require adventure capital, you require patient capital. And that is where all these high net worth individuals who have come together and created a fund, you, you know, it, it is uh, in terms of patient capital, they are not looking at returns within one or two years. They are looking at something like 10, 15 years. I think the sum and substance of what I'm saying is that there is a new global understanding in terms of both funding as well as sharing of intellectual property rights, essentially in the areas which concern everyone. That is required. I think the tests are going to be now. I mean, we are looking for a vaccine for uh, 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 COVID-19. Uh, uh, vaccine developments are going place, uh, taking place everywhere. And supposing an uh, American firm comes out with a vaccine, what do we do with that then? Will the benefits be available to the rest of the world? If so, under what term? What should be the alternative mechanisms in terms of uh, uh, creating, let us say, common, uh, common uh, global fund for global good uh, by each country participating? Because this is an issue where there is one common enemy against 200 countries. Previously, it was always, uh, uh, the, the, you know, uh, one enemy hitting a few countries and the rest. Uh, so I, am, I, I think, uh, let me just sum up. While sharing my own experience about uh, having played this game, both within India and outside, I think there is a newer level of understanding and perhaps this shock that we have, as people call it the World War III, uh, may actually uh, lead to a newer understanding. And that's why I say, I don't want to see just recovery to the old, where we were, but reinvent a new world. Thank you. that you were mentioning the other day, and I think has a connection to what you just said, that we had relied too much on competition. We thought that each one of us will discover great solutions to the problem, and the best solution will dominate, rest will die out. That was the model, the capitalist model in which we worked. The fact that India, called as copycat in the drug industry for a long time, it has supplied those life-saving drugs to the whole world, to, including to the USA, proves that building capacity to produce at large scale, at low cost of high quality, is something that you need when large scale requirement comes in society. So I think that needs, we mean, we should think about cooperation 
more than just the competition. And I would like that you could react on that as to how can we generate the RP system, which was already thought as a pivot of competition, as a part of collaboration, which means you pool the patents. Now, I may have one brick of a building. You may have another brick. Somebody else has a cement. Somebody, the fourth person has girders. But to make a building, we need all of them to come together. So the idea of pooling the patents to create, make them more viable bundles is something that we need to get into. I mean, if, there are hardly any companies in India or firms in India which are doing this kind of bundling of IP together and bringing those inventors together to say that, look, individually you will never achieve anything, but together you can make a breakthrough. What do you think about that? No, I think it's a great idea. As a matter of fact, we require innovative ideas. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you something. Uh, Anil, the challenge is uh, we have an unprecedented challenge. And to meet that unprecedented challenge, we have to create unprecedented solutions. Exactly. It's completely new, all right? So that means we just tear off what we have done and build a new future. I think unless we do that, it cannot work. See, in the past, what has happened, very frankly, is that things have worked under pressure. When there are huge challenges, then certain corrections have been made. Let me take one example. So I think the example that you gave is a brilliant one. You know, uh, this hydrochloroquine, for example, is being uh, sort of supplied to the rest of the world. It's a brilliant example. Uh, but if you go back into the history, if you remember when the HIV AIDS crisis came, Ciplan, yeah. the antiretrovirals were $10,000 a year. Okay. And it was the chemistry done in my own CSR laboratory, Indian Institute of Chemical Technology, Dr. Mukul Gurjar, on creating antiretrovirals uh, through a new process chemistry uh, that was uh, commercialized by CIPLA and supplied to the rest of the world at $350, $250. Yeah, $250 to $300. And then, of course, the prices further came down. That saved. And that actually led to Doha Declaration. That's right. That first time, intellectual property rights and public health came together. That was the first time in the history. Because that was the HIV AIDS crisis. Maybe the COVID-19 crisis. You know, we have to learn from the crisis. HIV AIDS crisis gave a Doha declaration, which was considered as a breakthrough. Because IPR and public health had never come together. I believe that COVID-19 also will be something similar. Because this time, at least in HIV AIDS, you know, some poor countries, Africa, etc., some select population was affected. Here, 200 countries are affected. Basically, so I uh, expect this to be the dawn of a new thinking and a new era. And like you said, pooling and all sorts of, I think we need to write down a dozen ideas, to be honest. We should throw open a sort of a grand challenge on what we can do, where we throw away our own notebooks and create a, a sort of a new notebook. I am out for it. One such problem, but the problem of orphan drugs, orphan diseases, you know, diseases which affect the third world, and did not affect the developed world, the drugs were not developed, the big companies will not invest in it. But if you think of it today, what we are finding in COVID-19, something very interesting, sir, 80% of the patients are asymptotic. That means they have the virus and their immune system is able to cope with it. Now, research on boosting immunology will require us to go back into the root of Ayurveda and many other things, lifestyle and ecosystem and food and so on. Now, surely, this may not be a completely proprietary innovation in the sense that you can't force me to eat something. I mean, you develop something good, I come to know of it, I will practice it. So these innovations will not necessarily generate private reward, but they will generate social reward. And I think time has come to think of new instruments. Gandhiji, 1929, sir, 24th July, he had announced the competition where an award was 7,700 pounds in 1929. It would be 10 crore today, maybe more than that, to redesign this spinning wheel. And he said, you can file a patent, but if you want the award money, you have to assign the IP right to the Khali Prabhu Samiti. Raj Gopalachari was member of the jury, banker was member of the jury, Gandhiji was the final gentleman. Can we now think about incentive system, and I will pose four challenges 
for the kind of incentive system we need. And you can, with your experience and insight, you could tell us how can these incentives be generated. You remember that in NIA when we were together, no IP firm charged for their time. Our average cost of filing patent has been was only fifteen thousand rupees because whether Anand and Anand, Surana and Surana, all the comp leading companies did not charge for their time. They said it is our duty because the first time when we proved that poor people can have patent, nobody thought patent can work for poor. It was we, the Anibi Network, which proved that patents can work for the poor. Now, what are the other mechanisms to create consortium of IP firms? And here, so us will have to play a role also. Where for startups, we can have IP angels. Just as we have venture fund, we have angel fund. Can we have IP angels? You invest, file the good patent, work hard, and take maybe one percent to two percent equity. So that, and you can also help in licensing if the fund, the startup doesn't want to commercialize it. So we need a new profession of IP angel. I would like to have your reaction on that. Second, instead of twenty years. The obsolescence factor in technological change is very high in electronics, maybe in chemistry also in certain areas. Can we give incentives for shorter life of patent? If somebody files for seven and a half years or five years or seven years or ten years, can we incentivize that process? Can we reduce the fees? Can we reduce the maintenance cost? Can we? What can we do to reward people to bring their innovation in open source faster? Third is when we. How do we incentivize pooling of patents? We know that you know that sir that many scientists in India still file one or two patents on each innovation. They don't create a thicket around that invention, which most big companies will do that. IBM will file two hundred patents around a particular innovation so that nobody can enter that space. In our country, maybe we don't have resources. Maybe we have not gone on that path. We are not able to do that. But because of the distributed nature of knowledge, if pooling is done, we have tremendously rich. Inside. So, how do we incentivize people from competing firms, from independent labs, private and public, otherwise competing in the professional world, academic world for different honors, but for solving problem, they come together and pool their innovations, IPs together. And lastly, sir, it is very clear that many drugs which are being repurposed now in the wake of COVID-19. There is a whole new industry which will emerge for repurposing or even redesigning the old antibiotics and antivirals to come become more useful in future. COVID-19 virus, as you know, sir, mutates very fast. To be able to develop a drug is not easy. That to to be able to develop a vaccine for a changing target for a moving target is not that easy, sir. So obviously there are challenges in this regard, and these challenges cannot be solved by any one firm. So, how do we bring consortium approach, cooperative approach, internationally and nationally and regionally and institutionally to solve these problems? No, no. I think all these ideas are absolutely uh, brilliant. I would say, and in fact, uh, it even goes back to the WHO Commission on Intellectual Property Rights, Innovation in Public Health. There have been number of suggestions, uh, you know, that have been made. What happens is that it is the reticence of the governments, particularly from the developed world, uh, which has uh, created uh, uh, sort of a major challenge. One can quite clearly revisit them and see. For example, I'll just give an example. You know, I, I remember in that uh, uh, meeting, he said Linux is an open source software. Uh, why can't we draw that analogy from software to uh, drug development? Drug discovery and development, and I said, "Why don't we do open source drug discovery?" And that appears actually as a recommendation. Nobody from the developed world tried to do that, and it was from the developing world, the genius of Samir Brahmachari, who created open source drug discovery for TB. Yeah, we are just made a suggestion. We didn't know how to do it, and he had, at a point in time, seven thousand plus participants. From 136 countries, and 40% of them students, actually, you know, and he of course worked uh, specifically on tuberculosis. Now you can just imagine a student participating in drug discovery, because these digital tools now allow you, basically, you know, to get in, and uh, it's, it's amazing. But it was unfortunately the Indian politics, you know, there is a politics in science and science in politics. 
that killed it. Very frankly, I'm sorry to say. Reinvent it. We should re redesign. Re re I think we have to redesign it. So I re think it. When, I, when I use the word reinvent, this was a sin, according to me. These were Correct. the past mistakes. I, I think we reinvite. We, we go back and say, how can we sort of resurrect it? Because you can just imagine the cost of a drug. Basically, if the discovery and development process, those costs are brought down dramatically. I mean, where is the issue? Actually, so I, th I think the single point that I'm trying to make is that there are lots of such suggestions which have come from all over the world. Everybody is thinking about it, basically. I think this is the time now to visit, uh, so sort of revisit, uh, because time is really very opportune. People are really doing introspection. Where do we go? Uh, where did we go wrong? And what do we need to do? Over? And the important point that you made, by the way. Uh, the, uh, June, come June, July, we are not going to say goodbye to uh, COVID-19. I'm sorry. Come winter, there are predictions it will reappear. In fact, the models that Harvard uh, uh, School has done is actually what do you do on uh, temporary uh, uh, closing down and opening up, closing down and opening up as these events actually take place. So I think we have to see, we can't give a knee-jerk reaction. We have to have a long-term view and a view which is completely different. Our past cannot be a burden on our future. is very simple. That would also mean, sir, that uh, we are spending of the order, something of the order of 300,000 uh, lakh crore, you know, of the money, uh, at least uh, twice our GDP we may be spending in dealing with COVID. But when it comes to creating funds, to invest in ideas, to invest in innovations, to give awards, or to, for that matter, uh, have an uh, innovation acquisition fund. You remember that in NIF, we had a GTIF, Grassroot Technological Innovation Acquisition Fund. You compensate the IP holder, acquire the right, make it open source. It shouldn't be proposed to government to create a 10,000 crore fund. Yeah acquire rights from the small startups, innovators, whatever, and create a public pool of solutions for mass large good. I mean, Indian image, not just in India, but globally should be seen as a provider of public goods to the whole world. That is how leadership will come our way. The American model is already dying. I mean, we you can see what is happening in their own country. If their health insurance model were to be there, the basis, a model for health for people, not many people will survive, sir, as you know. But in the country, we have been able to contain that because of all the weakness of public health system is still the best of the services that we have get are from public hospitals, public health. System. So I think we have decried a lot about public systems and public health, but this is time. And you know that the public health infrastructure in the at the grassroots level in the primary health center is extremely poor, sir. We all know. Yeah. So therefore, we should make sure that COVID crisis is not something which will erase or distract our attention from the need for robust public health infrastructure, innovations for, you may not get electricity in a primary health center. One of the Ghanaian Young Technological Innovation Award we gave two years ago was, if you don't have autoclave, doctor in his dispensary sterilize his equipment, his devices. 200 rupees a liter liquid, you put the device, your forceps, your scissor in that for two minutes and it will sterilize them. That was just a cold chamber, a box in which there's a one liter of liquid, put the device, put your forceps and scissor in that, take it out and they're sterilized. We need such extremely low cost solution to be popularized across all primary health centers and so on. The, the, I think we need to create, create a pressure that IP of this kind needs to be public good and those inventors must be compensated for that. So that incentive for invention doesn't go down. But do you think, how do we do that? How do we create that fund of 10,000 crore at least for rewarding these innovations? Yeah. No, I, I love your idea of uh, such a fund. In fact, I remember when I was a member of Science Advisory Committee to the Prime Minister, I had suggested a global technology acquisition fund mm -hmm. of a couple of billion dollars at that point in time. Of course, uh, with a different uh, uh, sort of objective, uh, but uh, yes, I, I, I'm fully with you. I'm, I'm fully with you uh, with regard to this. I think you, uh, this conversation itself generated about 
uh, 10 ideas in terms of what we can do. I think we should uh, uh, put them down uh, and say this is... Suhas, should we get some questions from people at this moment? Yes, sir. We have some questions coming in, but uh, I'll come back to the questions. But before that, I would like to say as IP professional and as a lawyer in this space, you see, uh, if we would want want to take the initiative and if the fund has to be set, we will try and you know, take these initiatives of a collaborative fund amongst the innovators and support the innovators. Uh, see, from about five IP professionals that we are and 200 lawyers from Legasis, I can say we would be committed in not charging a single rupee fee for these innovations which will come up. Uh, and that's the first step. And we will probably try and match a rupee to rupee on the fund contribution with few of the few of our clients and get them together. I think, sir, we are committed and we would want to demonstrate that commitment by taking actions and converting these ideas. Um, you know, some so of the questions are trickling in. Uh, come back to the question. Yeah, follow up webinar when you will tell us when we will discuss together action on each of the recommendations. Is that right? Absolutely right, sir. Uh, we will follow it up. And we will follow it up with action taken report to you. This is this is wonderful. I love that, Suhas. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. I think uh, one of the questions, and I think uh, more than question, it's a suggestion that has come up, is that uh, how do you take Gupta's idea of two weeks sensory lockdown every year, at least minimum? How do you make that mandate? and push it across. It's something, it, is, it has a spiritual connotation. When did families sit together without the burden of meetings and, you know, I'm getting late for my office and I have to do this and I have to do that. And the, you know, all those uh, short term deadlines which were driving our life away from the core of our life. I think those, that kind of uh, community or uh, personal life, people, many people have or many families have enjoyed first time and they should really relish it. Second, when did we hear so many birds in our garden or saw the sky so clean? People who, there are many people who have, or children who have seen first time so many stars in the sky. They had never seen them because there's so much pollution and so much of dust because of traffic. So I think this idea we should lobby for that and this has saved so much cost, mind you. What will affect the industry? We'll have to decide that there are continuous process industries where we may not be able to do that, but whichever are batch based industries where lockout is possible, you give a paid holiday to the workers. I mean, when do workers get paid holiday? So, if two weeks workers can be informed in advance, go home, have holiday. Go take your family wherever you want. Workers have never been given LTC. Please understand, private sector workers, that too from a small scale sector, which is where the large majority of informal sector workers work. You know the condition in which migrant laborers are living today? Millions of them? We cannot imagine. Hardworking people today are almost on the verge of seeking food from those who can help them. Now, this is not a good situation. So I think we must try to see this lockout period should be planned properly with advance notice. And one major purpose is nature is healing, but we are also going to heal ourselves. No, no, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. There's another question from Mr. Ramesh Sharma, who is uh, executive director with us. <coughs> as also, he is uh, he's a very distinguished IPS officer. And I'm just reading this out to say that he says, I love the concept that we should not talk of recovering from COVID-19, but reinventing ourselves. However, given the greed that pervades the consumer-driven economy that we live in, how can such ideal concept be implemented, especially by the governments in countries such as the US, China, EU? Yes. Well, <laughs> that's, uh, uh, you have hit the nail. As a matter of fact, that is uh, going to be uh, the uh, real challenge. But I'm just hoping that every shock uh, has a negative as well as a positive effect. And I hope at least uh, some of the leadership 
we'll do the introspection and see where we went wrong and uh, there will be a sort of correction one has to only uh, sort of uh, hope because there are two sides to a human being uh, there is this uh, greed uh, there is this short termism uh, that is uh, there is this me uh, but then there are others who talk about us uh, who think about vasudeva kutumbakam who think uh, in terms of a bigger picture and our hope really lies on that because uh, uh, and, and these emerge as leaders you know uh, from nowhere uh, a martin luther king emerges a mahatma gandhi emerges uh, you know ajay prakash narayan emerges at a point in time whenever there have been so my my hope I, of course take it with a pinch of salt because i am uh, considered as a dangerous optimist you know through the mayashawadi but my hope is that, that that will happen and maybe not a single leader what is happening is that uh, my hope is the young generation young generation today thinks very differently you know their heart is in the right place uh, there is a compassion there is a concern and so on and so forth so they will they will think about this and uh, anil while we are uh, sort of doing that to uh, uh, be uh, Uh, lock up our current lock up has become a kind uh, 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 lockdown has become a knockdown our current lockdown has become a knockdown how do we make sure that it doesn't become a knockdown it has become a knockdown for migrant workers for daily wagers uh, you know what ame and my, uh, myself do ame is my son every day we take a walk for 45 minutes to 1 hour and we take food and there are stray dogs on the street who remain hungry throughout the day we feed them we feed them because there is a curfew and there is nobody i'm just giving an illustration and i can add 10 such things i think from this we have to learn on on what we will gain but what we have lost during this and make sure that those losses uh, do not take place because once again i think it is not smile on some people's face all 130 crore indians i would say all 7 billion uh, sort of of the world so i think we have to learn from what we do and reinvent you are very right in fact there used to be a tradition that the first bread which was cooked was never eaten it was given away to the birds to the animals to the cow to the dogs to the ants and whosoever so if we accept that in every uh, thing that we process is the share of other non human sentient beings and also human other human beings who are poor and disadvantaged situation can change but i don't see any reason why the generosity that covid 19 has unleashed among the civil society people who are feeding these um, millions to varying extent uh, sustained i'm as you said you are very optimist and i'm very optimist that people will reflect on what actually is life for after all the fears and anxieties that we have and all the uh, i mean you can't eat money i mean us with all its wealth with all its wealth has lost the maximum number of lives unfortunately has maximum number of cases in the world has a strange dilemma that many many parts of the us do not want to maintain the lockout at all so it shows us the best of what capitalism can do and i think we need to learn from this we don't want to go that way at all we don't want to go that way at all so in some sense what india has achieved thanks to the very uh, harsh but a decisive decision that indian government took for lockout yes you are right it has put a lot of people into trouble so we should plan this healing period as planned holiday when people will not be their wages will not be cut and those who work daily should be provided some compensation I think universal basic income is one area where we are moving towards. Yeah, yeah. That, that is exactly what Anil I was coming to. That is exactly what I was coming to because it is not uh, an approach for those two weeks that we take. Yes. But it is something that is a sustained uh, sort of a strategy by looking at the big picture. Within which the small picture gets submerged. You get the point. Like uh, when you talked about universal basic. I mean. things of that kind so i think this is a time to sort of visit those uh, concepts too i i totally agree 
I think this is a grand opportunity. In this adversity, I'm seeing a grand opportunity. Sir, I, I must share, and I've been working with Legacis and I have a team, where when we floated the idea of universal basic income, I think four members of our team came forward and said about paying us our salary for the month. This is the income that I need. And somebody came back and said, I just need 60,000 rupees. Somebody came back and said, I just need 25,000 rupees. And actually they said, if our universal basic income requirement is satisfied, we are fine to go ahead and compromise and, and not ask for our monthly salaries and wages. Oh, that's wonderful. That's uh, wonderful. Amazing. That's an amazing story because that means I think the Gandhian dictum of experimental truth, truth by experiment, he never believed in dogmas. He said, don't believe what I said yesterday. What I say today is what my current position is. And I think we should do, <laughs> we should do experiments. What you narrated just now, Suhas, is a beautiful experiment. And I think among the 122 people that are attending this seminar, as I can see the number on the list, I appeal to all of you, all of us, we should do experiments and experimentally prove to ourselves that good sense can prevail. As Dr. Mashilkar has repeatedly said, we should not be too, uh, we should not be pessimistic. He is coming, I think. We should be welcoming him because uh, there is an extraordinary occasion today. And let Sohas explain about that. But uh, yes, he is one person who embodies everything that we have said. He made all the earning in his life for larger social good. We are talking about you. <laughs> so, we should really welcome him and uh, Dr. Joshi will of course introduce him so let us uh, move on to that agenda yes sir there are a couple of questions but we will answer them to the audience one on one uh, yeah. but I, I agree with you I think it's time for us to welcome Dr. K uh, I think uh, and, and he is somebody who is all also kind of motivated generations uh, of entrepreneurs, professionals, innovators, students, and, and the community. Uh, may I request uh, to bring it over? Okay, may, may I, uh, I mean, welcome sir, welcome on this uh, digital webinar. Uh, we try and speak Loud because I know uh, we, we, we will make you hear what we have to say. But I'm going to request uh, uh, Badmashi Professor Dr. J.B. Zoshi to actually uh, talk about Dr. Garda, his spoils, uh, you know, and what all uh, we look forward to from uh, Dr. Garda. Uh, Professor jo Zoshi? Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you very much for uh, coming online with us. Uh, to you. Yeah. Uh, respected Dr. Gharda, respected Dr. Mishankar, my dear friends, Professor Gupta, Suhas, and other dignitaries. I feel really privileged to participate in this function of World Innovation Day where real the global innovator, Dr. Garda, is being felicitated. As you know, uh, he started his business. I'm going to talk about his innovation part of it. He started with a uh, uh, total money of 15,000 rupees. And now the company's worth is more than 10,000 crores, which means that it is 40,000, 40% compounded growth in the past 65 years. So this is unparalleled. And out of whatever our earnings every year, more than 3,000 crores, 4 to 5% is spent in R&D. Uh, there is practically no company in India who's spending this kind of money in R&D and specifically the innovative processes and designs and software. Uh, Dr. Gharada, as everybody knows, is exceptional, has exceptional command on chemistry, exceptional command on chemical engineering, and outstanding entrepreneur. All three qualities put in a single person. He, and because of this, 
he has come out with many, many innovative products. He broke the monopoly of many multinationals such as Sandoz, Dow, Ronpulang, and developed innovative technologies for phenvalerate, isoproteron, cypermethrine, dicamba. The remarkable feature of his endeavor has been, in no case, it has been reverse engineering. He always developed cost-effective processes. In the case of isoproteron, he used a new and novel environmental friendly route by avoiding dangerous phosgene and methyl isocyanate, as Dr. Mashelkar said. This process is now globally called as Indian process. He got novel equipment done by, the, by vendors and equipment parts in India and spread the message of and practice of innovation, such as melt crystallization, nanotechnology-based liquid-liquid separations, agitated thin film evaporators, agitated mesh filters, refractory linings of totally new materials, ceramic diaphragms for electrolysis, developed processes uh, which operate at very high temperatures, greater than 1500 degrees, and also corrosive atmospheres. He developed electrodes for high temperature electrolysis. He has also developed many more technologies for pigments and specialty polymers. The remarkable feature is that he has generated cre creative ambience in the organization. Therefore, a large number of scientists, engineers have learned the process of innovation with practical training in a place called Dr. Garda University. I'm aware that such a highly trained manpower is immensely contributing to the society. They, and they proudly say they are Garda alumni, are part of Garda family. And I'll, I personally also feel like that. The creative ambience has also percolated up to the floor level of operators. And they bring in improvements up to atom economy. He spread the perimeter of innovation by developing equipment parts and intermediates through vendors. He pays, he pays vendors very graciously because they are doing effort for the first time and he never burdens them for asking them for guarantees. The remarkable innovation has been in the area of metallurgy. As we know, there are 3 billion uh, tons of red mud in the world and 5 million tons per year in India, equivalent to 300,000 tons per year of titanium. In addition, India is rich in titanium ores in terms of ilmenite and rutile sand. Our deposits are more than 20% of the world deposits. The tsunami in 2008 has deposited additional sand, that is raw material. However, at present, we are selling this sand at six rupees a kilogram, in which titanium is 50%, and we are buying back the titanium at 2,500 rupees per kilogram. Under the guidance of Dr. Garda, a novel process, which is 40% more energy efficient and most cost effective has been demonstrated and a demonstration plan of about 200 kgs per hour is, uh, will be soon in operation. He also has large number of ideas, one of the one of them is to use biomass as a raw material and create first thing is sugar, which is needed, which will be uh, at very, very low price and also uh, energy from biomass. Uh, as we know, Mahatma Gandhiji brought political freedom to India. 
it is my view that dr gharda is bringing economic freedom to india as we all know uh, the number of innovations which happen in the developed countries they are more and therefore they are rich our country is poor mainly because the number of innovations are less and uh, dr gharda is showing a great path to our young generation for making india uh, rich converting from poverty to richness he says how humble he is the ability of innovation i inherited from my parents i am only doing work which i enjoy i was born poor and i am going to die poor therefore he has contributed magnanimously to the society in terms of hospitals engineering colleges and other education initiatives and microfinancing what he says is innovation should lead into wealth wealth should generate additional innovative technologies those technologies should create wealth and continuously there should be parallel outlets for the society for their bigger good i'm i'm sure when the new generation learns this uh, innovative approach and brings in uh, a large number of processes and equipments and softwares which are first time in the world uh, we will get the india will get economic freedom of india sir jamshed tata we call him as father of industry in india dr gharda is father of innovative developments and actual implementations in india i take this opportunity to pay my tributes and salutes to dr gharda thank you Uh, thank you very much sir uh, thanks for uh, that uh, kind of uh, come uh, that introduction and uh, you know telling us something which uh, probably uh, some of us did not know uh, may i request nilesh kulkarni executive director with garda chemicals to kind of say a few words uh, nilesh are you there yes yes okay nilesh will you please uh, kind of uh, you know share uh, Two words with us. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's a very august gathering, and uh, I must uh, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, my greetings to all the seniors, respected Dr. Mashelkar, Professor Gupta, Professor Joshi, uh, Dr. Garda is also here, and uh, I'm very happy that uh, today he is receiving this award as an innovator of the year. i think there are very few people uh, globally who have decided not to publish too many papers but actually implement technologies and i think he is probably one of them and that's why probably he moved to the entrepreneurial side uh, of of technology i think uh, uh, like uh, professor joshi just said one of the brain child and i think which will really change the landscape of uh, uh the the global technology side on basic technologies would be the red mud uh, technology and uh, i think like dr garda we all hope that very soon we can uh, implement this on a larger scale and his foundations can actually implement this and uh, take this up uh, on a global scale on a scaled up version um like just another little bit on dr garda he actually it's interesting to know how many uh, entrepreneurs and how many thinkers and innovators actually start their businesses out of circumstances dr garda came back from michigan after his uh, doctorate and teaching in oklahoma and uh, hoping to get an academic job but eventually ended up uh, becoming a businessman or an industrialist or an entrepreneur but an entrepreneur who chose very different uh, a line he is a karma yogi totally and he believes in the doctrine of karma yogi so i think uh, all the members of the garda parivar our entire family at all the uh, at garda chemicals the garda foundations everybody also 
believe in the culture that he has inculcated in everybody. So we believe in public good. We believe in using knowledge uh, and then using it, uh, creating products and then all for the benefit of society. So I think with uh, very few people have such motives and such visions. And I think Dr. Garda has given us a great mission uh, to do that. And I'm very happy that he's uh, receiving this award. So thank you very much. And uh, I, I would uh, uh, take, uh, please take it over to us. Thank you very much for everything. Thanks a lot, Nilesh. Uh, sir, and I know uh, whenever I've called you, sir, you have said, where is my knighthood? I think that's the humor that has, that has kind of percolated all across. And uh, I would like to kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great pleasure and privilege to do these honors of uh, saying that you are the Indian innovator for 2020. On behalf of Legacies as well as Bombay Stock Exchange, we want to felicitate you. I, there is very little that we can give you because you have given so much to all of us. You have motivated us. You have ignited our minds. You have given every penny, every rupee that you have earned in your life for public good. What is it that we can give you except to pay respect to you, to recognize your contribution and kind of tell you, sir, we are ignited. Sir, we will try and emulate and follow you, although I know nobody can come up to that level in terms of your intellect, in terms of what you do on innovation side and what you have given to us. Sir, thank you very much. It would be great if you can share a few of your thoughts uh, at this juncture. Thank you very much, sir. By your time, I would request you to restrain from some of them. But your thanks sort of instigates me or rather motivates me <laughs> to Thing which I like anyway. So I'm going to do it. And this extra motivation is slightly unworthy. I mean, uncomfortable. <laughs> I would like to tell you something about myself, which I kept private, privately to myself also. My words recur very often to myself, to myself, and to myself. <laughs> I don't like my face and my features. <laughs> I don't look like a scholar. So that's, many people say no, no. And I say yes, yes. And so at least. That this you may be sure of that I'm not conceited about my look. My wife didn't like my look and it's just told me. So thank you for liking me. I was wondering which study woman would marry me. But she said that because you are I had the same part. I was wondering which Man will marry me. But I said, God, that you can together. The unmarriable man got the unmarriable woman. This is real true. Hope my wife is not alive. Confirm it. But, and uh, it is also still true that every time I mention her name, my eyes water. I think there's real emotion behind it. I, I'm coming back to, first of all, how to be innovative and how to like it. How to be innovative is more or less accidental. And it just happened in a few people. There are lots of clever people, no doubt. 
but there are not so many people who are also significantly innovative. By innovative, I mean seeing things which some people can see, but some cannot. And I happen to be one of the few, or simultaneously one of the many, who can see things which others do not. And that's what, at the age of 90 and a half, or whatever age I am, I am reading up to midnight every single day. I would like to say every married day also, but my married days are over. Ha ha ha. <laughs> Enjoy all what you are doing and work hard. <laughs> With a little bit of luck, you will be successful. <laughs> Little, not a little bit. Uh, gallops and gallops of luck. People in the world have gratitude. Most people don't like other people to be necessary. And I thank you for doing the difficult thing, praising me. Yes, I deserve a part of it. But then I got my own reward. I have enjoyed doing it. And even tonight, after all this grammar and things, I, if you call me at 10 30, 11 30 in the night, you'll find I pick up my phone within three days. You don't have to wake me up. And if you have a moderate amount of intelligence, which I do have, I I'm not sure that I'm stupid. Well, then that will be paid widely after that. Himself admits that he's stupid. But to be successful, it requires a certain amount of thing more than not being stupid. And a certain amount of, a lot of cooperation also. Now, Every time I talk about something or other, my old friend, Mashika, will always say that if there is anybody who can do it, it will be Dr. Gardner. Now I feel like telling him frequently that, look, we are putting an awful amount of burden on me. <laughs> I'm not God. I can't do everything that you think I can do. But at least I'll try harder. And all of you can't be bluffing and telling lies. So there must be an element of truth in it. I have succeeded also. Oh, really, Ramesh, you worry me in your enthusiasm about me. Yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, I have to do, but I guess. Someday Dr. Mashenka will start saying that. <laughs> and I I am also amazed and thankful for the new role that I see our friend, the lawyer, the nice lawyer. How can a lawyer be both a capable lawyer and a nice lawyer? Yeah. It's not <laughs> I am always yeah. a laughing criminal engineer. Yeah. Everybody says that for heaven's sake be serious for a while. I can be I said, only serious when I'm either completely dead or almost dead. Yeah. Which I would like to postpone for a few more years. Yes. 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 yes, as I said, I don't have the scholarly look, you know. I have a lot of full head of hair. I don't look like my, my children or 
कन्फर्म टिकेट सर डॉक्टर मार्शल केर इज सेइंग इट्स अ कन्फर्म टिकेट टू ऑस्लो नॉट टेंट आई कैन बाय अ कन्फर्म टिकेट आई कैन होल्ड इट एंड देन देन यू आर समबडी वो प्रोफेसर यू आर लुकिंग वो आउट एंड गेट इट आई जस्ट डोंट लुक प्रोफेसर एनीवे एवरीबॉडी हैज अ secret uh, disappointment but this i will tell you in all honesty i am a hard working man and i love my work i love my work to the extent that whenever people think i'm sleeping and don't want to disturb me I said, even the act of keeping your eyes open when you're not asleep is an expenditure of energy. So I don't keep my eyes open when I'm not actually asleep. And all the waking moments are on this, on that, on that, on this, on that. And why do I do it? I will always love it. And my reward is mostly internal. I feel happy doing what I'm doing. And look, head mud is not all that difficult. It's been overlooked now for so many years. If you want it, you may get it. <laughs> And. Fancy theorem that all sorts of fancy theory, <laughs> but to prove a point, if you do this and do this and do this, there's a very good chance that you will succeed in doing this. But again, I tell you what I admire in you. Your lofty professorial forehead, which I don't have, I got a bushy, grassy <laughs> forehead, <laughs> and <laughs> unfortunately, I'm what? What am I? What is my age now? One hundred and one. So I have very. I think we have lost the voice. Yes, maybe. Maybe I'm the story also that Allah favors the feeble-minded. So if he, if there is an Allah who favors the feeble-minded, he may make me successful. That's all. Bye. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for an honest uh, lawyer also. <laughs> And may, may we meet once again where you are at the uh, docks to see me off to the Oslo fair. Yes, sir. We will all look forward to that. We all look forward. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Uh, In Gujarati, we have saying, "Amara mode saka." Correct. That is the way you move. I don't write the. I don't describe the Oslo awards. Huh? On the contrary, I like them some more. Okay. Bye bye. No, no. Thanks a lot, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. God bless. Long life. Long life. God bless you, sir.
on this very sweet note i'm going to i'm going to kind of request uh, final concluding remarks from uh, dr marshalkar and yes i'm here yeah i'm very glad i'm thank you thank you thank you you being strong to wish me back as i want to what a selfish way of wishing you to be strong Okay. Thank you, Baba. So may I request Dr. Marshall for a final word, sir? Is he his connection? I think I think we we probably he may not have heard me. So, Professor Gupta, will you will you want to kind of summarize what we tried to do today and uh, kind of pave way for uh, the future? i think the fact that you recognize some young innovators when we joined you were just doing that the, that was a very nice gesture more recognition comes the young people's way more uh, interest they will feel and more better innovations we will get so that was a very nice uh, gesture on the part of bsc bombay stock exchange and legacies the discussion that we have had uh, and let me also say that what dr joshi has told us about dr garda's journey and what dr kk garda himself told us i am a hard working man he rep repeated it half a dozen time and today the value of hard work perhaps is not that evident among some people or many young people because there is a sense of entitlement that because we are bright because we have studied so much we should get something rather than saying that no matter at what age you are he still is working till 11 o'clock in the night you have to prove yourself every day you have to prove yourself every day we cannot sit on our laurels so i think this message that dr dr garda gave three messages one he said i never hurt anybody because i put myself in that situation and if somebody did to me what will i feel so i when you hurt somebody you hurt yourself that was very thoughtful a lesson that i am carrying away with me today he also said that can can you hear me This is Marshall K here. Ha, yes, sir. But I was just—I'll just finish then, and you kindly give the final remark. I was just saying that he said, "I love my work, and my work yeah. is reward." So yeah. So, so yeah. please go ahead, sir. Yes, I think uh, there is something wrong with the system. But can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, sir. We can hear you. Very good. So I'll—I'll I'll, I'll say only this uh, that. Uh, Hundred eight points. Better than ever, so as to say. To me, he is not just an individual. He is just a tremendous, uh, uh, innovative uh, institution. And you know what he said? I see what everybody sees, and some people don't see something. I would put it this way: that all of us see. He also sees, but what he thinks, none of us can think. That is the definition of an innovator. And there is another definition that innovator is one who does not know it cannot be done. And that is our uh, uh, Keki. That is uh, uh, you know the man that we have honored today. In fact, he has honored us by accepting that invitation. I would say this is an extraordinarily special evening uh, in our lives. And thank you for making it happen. Thank you very much, sir. Um, yes, Professor Gupta, you were saying something. I would just say I was just saying that uh, the lessons of his life are very evident. Even now, he feels challenged by the unsolved problems. Even now, he feels challenged by the as Dr. Joshi mentioned that tsunami brought so much of sand. Now, your passion is the unsolved problem. and his passion even at this age is very motivating i mean it's a role model for all of us we should never say we are retired i mean he has never retired in his life for that matter he still continues to face challenges and confront them with great valor valor and thinking i remember when he first mentioned to me about redmart i downloaded a lot of patents and printed it and gave it to them gave it to him and he went through them all night relish mentioned to me that he very first night he got those he was going through them 
So his desire to learn, his hunger for knowledge is so intense that uh, we all need to remember that being, he also said people should be kind. He, he preferred to be a kind person and a nice person. He mentioned that in context of uh, relation of others that, you know, we should be kind, but we should, in, in fact, Suhas, he was saying that you as a lawyer, you are kind, but you also should be nice. And that's very important. We can be kind, but we should also be nice. We should not be cruel. We should not be brute. We should not hurt anybody. And I think living legend of Dr. Kekil's type, if he says that, you now know that it is not somebody who has said it in ancient times, someone living around us, someone achieving results, somebody who has credibility believes in these values. And these are eternal values that uh, I think he has reinforced in all of us the basic goodness, whatever we have. And I really pay tribute to him and to all of you for this wonderful occasion. May God bless him long life and all of you be healthy and safe. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thanks for that. I think it was a very interesting session uh, we had uh, since afternoon. Uh, over to you, JD. Uh, thank you, Sohas. Uh, sirs, what can I say? What a fantastic uh, session. It absolutely went to a crescendo. A big thank you to Dr. Gharda himself for joining us and uh, sharing the message. I mean, great lessons for all of us. Sir. You're a living legend. Thank you very much. A uh, big thank you to uh, Dr. Marshalkar, uh, Professor uh, Joshi, and uh, Professor Gupta. Thank you for joining us for this uh, part of the felicitation and all the words of wisdom that you shared. Uh, a big thank you to all our uh, attendees who uh, were with us for the last uh, three hours and 20 minutes. Thank you and uh, a happy World IP Day celebration to everyone. Have a great evening ahead.